My name is Susanna Nelson. Uh, we are here today at the Dixie University camp campus. Uh, is, the date is November 13th, 2018. And uh, we are here at uh, 10 a.m. in the morning. And we are here with um, Shannon Martineau Anderson to um, record an oral history of her father, LeVan Martineau. Uh, the people that are involved today are myself, Susanna Nelson, S-U-S-A-N-N-A-H-N-I-L-S-S-O-N. -S I'm -S -S uh, the interviewer. Also is Shannon Martineau. You can go ahead and spell your name. And your it's Shannon Doa, S-H-A-N-A-N. D-O-A-H, Anderson, A-N-D-E-R-S-O-N. And also with us is the archivist from <coughs> Dixie State University. Hi, I'm Kathleen Broder. It's K-A-T-H-L-E-E-N, Broder, B-R-O-E-D-E-R. -E -E and our videographer today? Mike Gardner, M-I-K-E-G-A-R-D-N-E-R. -E and I just want to thank everyone for being here today. And we are going to start uh, recording an oral history of uh, Shannon's uh, father, LeVan Martineau. Uh, LeVan Martineau uh, was an important figure here in the St. George area and in this whole southern Utah area. He was the writer of two very important books. This one, The Rock Begin to Speak. And this one, the Southern Paiutes legend, lore, language, and uh, lineage. Um, and so we feel like it would be a, a great thing to record his history uh, of his life. And that's what we're here to do today. Um, I'm going to start out by asking Shannon a little bit about uh, her memories of her father. And we're going to start with his youth. Uh, and who his parents, uh, just kind of say who his parents were and where they came from and tell a little bit about his youth and, and what happened to him uh, during his young, young days. Um, LeVan Martineau, his uh, real name is Douglas LeVan Martineau. His father was Amos Douglas Martineau and his mother was Mavis Sorensen. Um, Amos was born in Chuichupa, Mexico, and we did go down there when I was probably in my early teens. We traveled down there to Mexico and we got to visit a lot of the relatives. They're still, they still got a colony down there of Martinos that still live in Mexico, but <clears throat> that's where his dad was from. And um, my mom, his second wife, was Evelina May McPhee, and she is from the Shivwitz. Paiute Indian tribe of Utah, which is located just outside of St. George, Utah. My dad, in his youth, um, was, he was born in Kanab, Utah, and he, uh, I'm not sure how long he lived there, but um, his dad, Amos, eventually they moved to Cedar City, Utah, and I, I don't know if they migrated here and there, uh, you know, just um, working here and there, but he did live with his dad and his mom until I think he was 12 years old and his dad passed away and his mom had died prior to that. I'm not sure how many years, you'd have to look at the, the history on that. <clears throat> but when he was 12, his, when his father passed, passed away, his um, relatives and I, I guess he'd come back from a, a uh, Boy Scout camp at two in the morning and the house was burnt down and the the scoutmaster didn't know where to take him so he got dropped off with some friends and he um, I guess after he'd found out his dad had passed away none of his relatives or anybody came to take him in so there was um, a Paiute guy that lived in a sheep wagon and he had one arm and he says if your relatives don't want you I'll take you in so his, his um, Paiute, he had a Paiute family from then on. And so he was raised Paiute. And so he always used to say, I'm like a red apple, uh, or I'm like a, 
an apple inside out. He says, I'm white on the outside, but red on the inside. <laughs> so he always believed that um, through those teachings, he learned the language. He just talked throughout his teens, Paiute, to all of his friends, and he learned everything he could. And he told me from a young age that, and, I, and I've witnessed it till, till he was older, but he had a t-shirt with a pocket. And he always had a, a, just one folded piece of paper and a pencil. And every time he'd hear something, he'd pull out his paper, he'd start writing little notes. And then at the end of the day, he'd go through his whole paper and whatever was important, he'd put down in a, in a, I guess like a notebook, like a scrapbook. And I have a lot of those today. I have all his books from <clears throat> after he passed away. And they're all smeared pencil writing, but he just learned at a young age to start preserving things. And I don't know how that came about, why he wanted to just start preserving things. But <clears throat> throughout the years, I've heard from my side of the family on the, the, the Paiute side that if it wasn't for his um, preserving a lot of that, it would have died out. And he didn't do it for publicity. He didn't do it for to get all the information to write a book. He just started preserving stuff. And I thought that was great that there was so much stuff that I think would be lost if it wasn't for that. And so throughout his whole life, I don't care if it was on the native side or on his the Anglo side, he would just start writing things down. So he did preserve a lot of history that way. Very interesting, yes. <clears throat> he was a very pro prolific writer. Mm -hmm. um, did, can you remember the name of the man that took him in uh, when he was first orphaned? He was my relative. Um, his name... Shoot, I got a bad memory. Um, I know Bushhead, Edric Bushhead. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> His name is Edric Bushhead, and he was my grandma's nephew. And so, Edric Bushhead was Shivwitz Paiute, and but he lived up in Cedar in the Cedar Band and a lot of the villages over there. <clears throat> so he lived up there in a sheep wagon. Um, and just took him in, and, and Edric Bushhead, his job was to go from town to town during the seasons and pick um, carrots, whatever, uh, I guess the farming and irrigation, anything that needed to be done when they gather in for, uh, you know, gather the foods. And so my dad, that was his new life, was to go, they went up to Richfield and they picked carrots and they picked whatever else. Um, I know they went up to Salt Lake and picked cherries or in Ogden somewhere. So. They just migrated wherever the farms were to just pick, pick from the farms to, to get paid for it. And so that was his new life. And he has a lot of stories from Richfield. I guess they spend a majority of their time up there um, gathering. And uh, I guess a lot of the other tribes were there. They had Navajos there and a lot of the bands were there. So they had um, like gatherings and a lot of special events that happened just, just um, from that. And through that, he met my mom years later, um, which was his, Edric's relative, mm -hmm. Evelina. But, but living up in Richfield, that's where he met his first, his first wife, Okay. Doris. Um, yeah, so he did learn. Tell some of the things that you think were important from the native side that mm -hmm. he learned in his youth, some of the more important things. I think number one would be the language, because today I can't speak it. And when my dad was alive, I'd ask him questions, and I'd ask him words, and he would tell me. So from him, I, just listening to the elders, I could pretty much understand what they were saying. And so today, we're trying to bring it back, but it's just hard, because you have nobody to converse with, so you're pretty much on your own telling yourself, well, I need to learn this word today, but you won't remember it if you have nobody to talk to. So he learned the language and they spoke it fluently back in the 50s and 40s. And so he, I think learning the language was number one. And Edric taught him how to um, sing songs, he taught him um, bow making, arrow making. And then there was other bands up there of, of um, elders that had, were still making bows and arrows and arrowheads. And so he learned how to do all of that. And 
when they would travel up north, like to Fort Duchesne and to the Ute tribe, a lot of those, the, the tribal people up there um, spoke sign language because they were older people and they were deaf or they, were, they couldn't really hear good. So he started to learn sign language because he would see them all talking with their hands and he thought that was fascinating. So every chance he got, he just would ask questions. How do you say this in sign? And so he learned sign language and that, I think that really stuck to him was one of the main things was sign language because it was just fascinating that they could, didn't matter what tribe it was, they all knew how to sign and, and it was universal. So every tribe knew how to speak to each other through sign. Mm -hmm. So this type of sign language is not our American sign language, it is native mm -hmm. sign language just within the native peoples that mm -hmm. they have a certain signage for yeah for communicating that is not connected to our our, our American sign language yeah at all. it's not but um, through his research on sign language he found out that the deaf mute Institute back in Washington DC um, Mallory I have to look up the full name but Mallory had done in the early 1900s a study on the Indian Sign Language and he brought some old world people back from from the old world and he brought seven Utes from from Utah and they met and they signed just they could they could understand each other it only when it came to the animals they couldn't understand each other so somehow that sign language was universal that it was with the old people from the old world to the, the, to the Indians over here. So, mm -hmm. And that's in a study and that's in a book. You could find it. I'm not, <laughs> not sure how you can get a hold of it, but, mm -hmm. but they understood the signs. And my dad said that the only troubles he had in learning signs was if he went to Canada and they would point. Well, the, the, for example, he, this, the old man kept pointing at his elbow and he had to question why. Why do you keep pointing at your elbow? And they said that they're is a river up there called Elbow River. And so he was referring to that. So it was just little gestures like that that were different, but it all still was understandable. Mm, very good. So other than the sign language, uh, arrowhead making, bow and arrow, um, he learned to bead. Uh, he wasn't very good at it, but he learned it. <laughs> um, uh, and the sign language got him into wanting to learn the petroglyphs because um, an older man went out to the Parowan Gap area and told him what some of those signs meant out there. And so it was just fascinating to him. So he got into, that's how he got into wanting to learn petroglyph. Mm -hmm. All right, and then uh, I know you didn't mention dancing, but he did he take up uh, actual learning of the native dancing mm -hmm. as well? As and that that's how he was doing his own beadwork was because um, they, he was in the Boy Scouts, and so the Boy Scout troops wanted them to do Native American dancing. So he got all of his buddies that were up at the Cedar Village, and they all made their regalias, and they started to perform for the different church branches. And then pretty soon they started to go travel all over the place. And so the, he learned everything from tanning the hide to... Um, making the arrows, the bows, just, you know, just the full regalia. And then some of the dances, like the mountain sheep dance, and um, he made his own bustles and gathered all of the materials. And so he did learn how to dance. And, and that dance group was also, uh, the, the native dance group would go all over to powwows and special events, and they'd go to Flagstaff, and they'd um, be in the parade over there. So it was kind of a... I guess it was quite a bit of him that would go around touring, just, just dancing. Mm -hmm. So this was still while he was in his teen years. Mm -hmm. he was doing Teens and twenties, yeah. Okay. And then um, after that, he moved on to joining the U.S. military. Mm -hmm. And then, can you tell us any memories you might have of why he did that? Was it was he drafted? Was he was he actually did he join? Did he? he knew he was going to be drafted, he said. And so him and his Indian buddies said, well, let's just go up and enlist because they're going to draft us anyway. So they went and enlisted, and I guess they took a train up to Salt Lake. And on their way up, they were talking to each other on, well, what do you want to join? Um, is it going to be the Air Force, the Army? So they were all talking about it, and they were saying that it seemed like the, the the Air Force would have been the simplest one out of all of them, so they just chose the Air Force. And so when they got up there, um, they were 
asked questions on what they did in their life to want to be in the Air Force. And my dad said that he herded cattle <clears throat> um, a lot of the time. And so they said, well, if you can herd cattle, you can herd airplanes. So <laughs> they put him as an air pilot uh, control operator. And so he went back, back east to, to learn how to do, do all of that. And that was the 1955. And before he left, he had met um, an Indian family in St. George that um, he had got a liking to one of the, the younger girls. And so that was Doris Kanosh. And so he started writing to her while he was in training. And, and I guess they eventually, he came back, got married. He married her and they moved to California and that's where he was stationed over in California. And that's where my oldest sister, Dorina, was born <clears throat> on the base in California in 1955. And so um, from there, he went over to Korea. And while he was in Korea, he was nitpicking everybody's brains. He got fascinated with the cryptanalysis side of how they, they um, uh, interpret, I guess, all of the, the, the what do you call those? Codes. Um, the codes, yeah. And so every night after when they were in their, their tents, he just started to, to ask questions. And so he was fascinated with cryptanalysis and how that repetition of, of deciphering something um, did something inside his brain to think, well, maybe that's the same with the petroglyph and the Indian writing at home, that it ha must, if you're going to do a symbol in, in picture writing, then it has to be based off of cryptanalysis. So he just, he, he's, he learned all he could while he was over in Korea on that. And when he came home, that's when he became, I guess, he spent the majority of his life from then on after he got out of the service. He just did his four years and then um, became fascinated with interpreting the, the picture writing. And so that's where that led him after. And he, he could have, they told him when he left the services, if he wanted to stay longer, that they would give him, he would be making a lot of money and he could uh, have a good career on it. But he just said his, his, people was at home, his family was at home, and his loves were at home, and he just, he didn't want to travel or be away from the Paiute country because of all the things that he learned in being raised in Paiute country that he said he needed to come home. And so he came home, he didn't have a good job, never had any steady job. He just, um, he didn't care, just uh, being poor, but he just loved the, the country so much that he didn't want to be apart from it. And so. That's when he started writing more things down on the, the tribal, tribal information and learning, going around every pet, picture, uh, petroglyph he could get a hold of or take a picture of. He would take pictures and go and ask the elders, well, what do you think this means? Or how do you do this in sign? Do you think this is, goes with this picture? So he just started asking questions and pretty soon he started writing down little notes. And I actually have all his library of penciled notes. <clears throat> And it's in at least four different books. And so back from the 50s on is just pencil notes of what he thought this interpretation was. And then he'd go back and erase it and do it over. I have pages that are so raced over and drawn, re rewritten, rewritten that it's just, you could tell his passion was in learning that because he's just devoted his whole life. He said 40 plus years just learning how to, to analyze what those writings meant. One of the things I did was that when he and his native uh, friends joined and they were put into a bunkhouse with a bunch of other people, they couldn't sleep on the bunks. They <laughs> could not, they, they took everything off and slept on the floor. Yeah, they slept right on the floor and they said it was cold back in the year that they went back and it was freezing. but. They said they were so used to sleeping on the ground because I guess in Cedar City where he was based most of his life when he was in his teens in Richfield, he said they, they slept on the ground. They didn't, in the, the sheep wagon, they slept on the ground. He slept on the ground. And so he just, that was his life was just having his sleeping bag and rolling it out wherever he was. And you're out picking carrots, you just roll your sleeping bag wherever you were. And so going into the service and having to sleep on a mattress, he said it was bad on his back. And so they all, him and his uh, Indian buddy slept on the ground until they got caught. And so they had to end that, but it was just, he, he lived a, a really simple life. Yeah, I noticed 
by reading through his autobiography that he actually spent most of his life sleeping outside. Mm -hmm. He usually never, hardly ever slept in the house. Mm -hmm. He slept and, on a porch or yep. on the ground yeah. Yeah. or in a teepee. Yeah, and that's how I was raised. Um, was I started dancing, I, I think since I could walk, but I remember I have a photo of me when I was two, two years old dancing at a powwow, and we lived in a teepee all summer. We would go from powwow to powwow. We went all the way up to Canada, and he didn't have a job, so the way he made money was he'd make arrowheads, and he'd sell them for a couple dollars, and that would get gas money to go to the next powwow. But every tribe that we visited, they were very generous. They always fed, so we always had food. And so it was pretty much just the gas to get there. And then they always provided gifts and blankets. And so we were well taken care of, but we lived in a teepee. And they normally supplied the teepee poles. So we would just carry our canvas teepee with us wherever we went and a station wagon and piled high with blankets. And me and my sisters and my dad would just travel all over. <clears throat> and my mom left my dad um, when I was two. So I was raised by my dad but we would visit our mom every year so it wasn't like I wasn't didn't have a mom in my life but our dad raised us and he raised us traditionally to be to be Paiute. He says that um, you're you may be half white but anytime you want to go visit your relatives on my side he said that's fine he said but um, he felt that the the native way was the the true way to be raised because um, it was simple, but yet you, I guess your survival skills were, uh, I don't know if it was easier to get through life because I'm dark skinned. I may be half white, but I, I could never pass as a white person <laughs> in life. And so knowing that we were raised fully Indian and I don't care what tribe we went to, he would have us sit down with the elders and they would talk to us. So we were raised by elders, is how I, I say, through life, because of all of the, he made a point to, you go listen to what they have to say, I don't care if it's not your tribe, you learn from them anything you can. And so I have a multitude of knowledge growing up from, from all over, and we call them family. They may not be by blood, but I have moms all over the United States and Canada, I have dads, I have uncles, sisters, and they're just family. So no matter where you go, we you're never you're never orphaned. You're never left alone. Like they they said, my dad <clears throat> in Indian country, if a child has no mom and dad, um, you you never let them know they're orphaned. You take them in. You call them. This is I'm your I'm your mom. That's your dad. That's your uncle. That's your grandpa. So he was raised to never feel like he were, had no family. So. And that's the way he taught us. So I don't care where I go in the United States today. If I go all the way back east, I'll have family back there. May not be by blood, but he taught us that there's, you, no matter where you are in life, you'll always have somebody to, to support you and back you up. And um, it's, it's a good life. I, I love it. I loved growing up, traveled every year. Last pa past eight years being married, I haven't really traveled. And so... I'm getting that, that bug where <laughs> I need to get out and travel. <laughs> but it was a, he raised us, I think he raised us really well. We have good, um, good moral values. And one thing that he always taught us, like he said his dad taught him, was to never lie and to always be on time. He said, because if you're not on time, then you're lying because you didn't show up when you said you would. So <laughs> those were the two main things that he instilled in us. Well, let's go back to let's go back to his um, older sisters and that, yeah. that first marriage a little bit. Doris Kanash was his first wife, and she was from the Kusharam band, which is in Richfield, and that's where he met her when he was out in the fields picking carrots or whatever they picked up there. And um, he married her. She was young. I'm not sure. 1955 is when he enlisted. So after he married her and they had the first child. Um, she was. She had another child, which was um, Sophia, and um, she was pregnant with a third child, uh, which was going to be a boy. But um, during the labor, the doctor mistakenly thought the baby was breech and spent uh, a couple hours trying to turn the baby around, and uh, it killed 
the baby and the mother because the doctor didn't, I guess it was, uh, what do you call it, the blood, loss of blood and shock. So she passed away and his son passed away. And then um, that's when he, I guess it took a couple of years, but he finally met my mom. And then he married her and he had my sister Carmen. She's the oldest out of, out of there. And then when he, when she was pregnant, my mom was pregnant with my sister Georgetta. Um, she went into labor and that's when Dorina's sister Sophie died the day that uh, Jetta was born, or the day before Jetta was born, because um, uh, we lived out on the Shivitz Reservation, and the speed limit back in the <clears throat> in the 60s was 55 through residential area, and she was playing in the road and got hit by a car, and then then my sister was born the next day, <clears throat> and so Dorina lost her full sister there, and then then I was born a, a year later, and so through Evelina, she and my dad. There was a three of us daughters, so there was four of us. Uh, um, that was my dad's full daughters, and then years later he adopted an Apache girl. My oldest sister Dorina fell in love with her because she used to babysit um, her Rachel. We call her Rachel. Her, her that's not her real name, but when we adopted her, we changed it to Rachel. And so the, there was five of us girls that my dad raised and went around to powwows and. He never married again after Evelina. Um, when I was two years old, he, she, she uh, left my dad, and so um, he pretty much never married again, but he had girlfriends. I, I remember going around everywhere and saying, oh, you are my dad's girlfriend, are you my dad's girlfriend? <laughs> so he just, he never just wanted, never wanted to marry again. I guess it hurt when my mom left, and so he just, just didn't want to marry again. So he has the, the for full daughters. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Okay, uh, so, um, yeah, this a little bit already, uh, but his livelihood <coughs> and resources um, were basically doing odd jobs mm -hmm. and then also making the arrowheads. And, and, and then he sold, he sold the, tell us about how he did that. He sold the arrows to <coughs> arrowheads to curio shops, or how did it work? He had a few rock shops that he would go and do trades with, because they'd have the, the rock shops would have the really big rocks that he could make a lot of arrowheads out of, so he would go and trade um, arrowheads. But the majority of the times, we'd be at a powwow, and we had a truck, and so he'd just be sitting on the tailgate, just whittling away at an arrowhead. And then people would come over and watch him make the arrowhead, and they'd say, oh, you're going to sell that? And so he'd say, yeah, you can have it for a couple of dollars. So he just got well known for being an arrowhead maker. So anytime anybody needed an arrow, they would just, I mean, an arrowhead, they'd come over and they'd buy it from him. But he did have some places where he stopped that, um, like trading post, and he would sell some to them. So the majority of the time it was through that. And then a lot of the tribes would... Um, have giveaways and they'd give you blankets or cash and so we'd get money for travel to go to the next powwow. And I'm not sure if he sold beadwork. I know he didn't bead it, but <clears throat> my um, when we got older we did a lot of the beading, but I don't think any of the, the crafts other than the arrowheads is how he made his living. And then of course he did the book and the, the Rocks Begin to Speak book in the 1970s, so he did get royalty from that. and so. I think that carried him through was, was getting the royalty money. <clears throat> Tell us a little bit about how this book came about. Well, like I said, he was collecting information and, and all of those loose leaves that I have, the notebooks at home, that he would just write it down. And he happened to be at a Sundance up, uh, up north by Fort Duchesne. And there was the publisher, Casey Publications, was there doing an interview for some Southwest Arts um, magazine that he was doing. And somebody introduced him, and <clears throat> he's seen my dad's notes, and he said that the pages were so worn that it, there must be some truth in all that he was studying for the pages to be worn as much as they were, that he must have been... Uh, passionate about his work. So he looked through the books and he says, would you be interested in doing an interpretation book on, on petroglyphs for his, his publication? 
And so he thought about it and says, well, maybe I can write something up. So he did have a magazine. I can't think of the magazine. Um, but he did an article in there. Casey Publication owned the magazines. He goes, well, can you do one article on what you know and how you, you decipher these and explain how, how they can be deciphered? So my dad did one article for the magazine, and it was so popular that um, the, the publisher seen that it was a moneymaker, and he says, well, if you can do me a whole book, he says that um, I'll advance you the money to travel where you need to take the photos of the pictures you want to put in the book and to do the artwork. And so uh, my dad took a full year to just, just get it organized enough to be in a book, and then he showed it to the publisher. And so it probably took two years to get that book written, but <clears throat> my dad never intended to do it. He was just gathering information for himself. He wanted to learn it. He was so curious about the different tribes that he wanted to learn the writing so he can go around and, and know the stories because they're all lost. And they're, he always said they were libraries of stories. Every canyon you went up, every, every reservation you went to, they, those were the libraries. But uh, just the elders knew it and they would share like the oral history with their family or their tribe. And so the tribal people knew it, but they never shared it with anybody. And my dad always says that if it's oral, nobody's ever going to know, and nobody's ever going to believe you, unless it's actually written down that um, their history is going to die. So he was preserving it for himself to learn. And I guess some of the tribes found out about it, and they invited him to, to, to their reservation to talk. I guess they tested him. There was a tribe. Um, in Arizona that invited him over and says, well, we want to see if you can read this writing. So um, he went and read the writing. Uh, it was a map, and he said it was telling them that if you go down here, you'll come across this, and it looks like there was a battle. You know, he just, just was rambling the story out, and they says that's true. He said, so they took him down the path and showed him where where the battle happened and where there was water. And then, so they believed my dad. They says, well, how can you lie about something that is our history? Never having been there before. <clears throat> and so they, from that day, back in the six, no, back in the seventies, they hired him every year. And they took all of the school kids out to learn about the petroglyphs and that it had meaning, meaning and that it wasn't just doodling or art like everybody now says it is, that it was their history, it was their library. So. So he would do um, little books and reports for the tribes because um, he wasn't trying to impress or, I guess, uh, prove a point that it was a writing system. They already knew it was a writing system. He learned it from the tribes that it was a writing system. So um, he had done that with the tribes. And so when this book deal came along, he thought, well, I guess I could um, write a book and just share what little I have. He was afraid to write it. He said he back when he wrote it, he was, I, I'm not sure of the percentage, but maybe 40% he could read. And he didn't want to publish a book till he was at least 90% able to read every, every symbol. But he did it because the publisher pushed him. And so he said he wasn't really happy with it because there was so much more that he could explain now uh, or back in the 90s after he had learned a lot more. But he did the book and it became uh, one of the best sellers. And I don't know how many prints it's, it's been in, but it's been in quite a bit of reprints. And so um, it was popular. And, but he never went to college. He never got a degree in anything. So going to a lot of the, uh, he was hired to go speak lectures at a lot of the, the, the colleges and different places. And so because he was a white man talking about reading art, like they call it, that was, was art in it, that he got a lot of criticism in the white world because he was a white guy reading Indian writing, saying that it couldn't be read. So, uh, and he wasn't no scholar. He wasn't, had no degree. So he, he was put down a lot, but he didn't care because he knew the truth. He was raised knowing. He was raised reading it. He was raised by the Indians knowing that what the truth was. So he did it regardless of what people said. So he, he had a passion about it. And if, he, if somebody's going to spend over 40 years studying a writing system, there's got to be a lot of truth to it. 
I agree. If he had his, uh, if he was more knowledgeable in the 90s, did he want to do like a, a revised version? Yes. Or did he ever do that? I have it. I have it. It's a Rocks Begin to Speak to book. But um, he has the intro. He has uh, a, a lot of the interpretations. He has a lot of chapters in there. But he's missing seven chapters, and I can't find them. And he has doodling that says, you need to look at this, this book or that book. So it's not quite complete, but yeah, I got it. Uh, and I'm not sure if I want to publish it as a Rocks Begin to Speak to book. Um, right now I'm working on a dictionary, because he had four volumes of dictionaries. He'd have the symbol, say, of a, a sun symbol, and he'd have the meaning next to it, a variety of meanings. So I, I'm working on that right now to do a digit. Uh, uh, dictionary of symbols. And so I'm thinking to put the introduction of the rocks begin to speak to into the dictionary. Uh, just just put them together, merge them together. So yeah, it, it'll be published. Um, and it's 90% readable now. And so even though he's passed away, um, he'll have more credibility because, you know, when you're alive, you, you everybody wants to put you down because they say it can't be read. But um, 90% readable, I think people are going to look through a dictionary, see a symbol, maybe go out to a site and say, yeah, that's that's true. It looks like the same symbol and it can be read. So, so what would you call it? Um, right now, it's just a uh, symbol dictionary. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm working with a professor that we're going to get it um, published. Right now, we're digitizing it. Because everything's in pencil, it can be smeared. We have everything scanned. Um, so everything's on a little disc right now. And so I'm going through his typing. And if you look through his notes, he writes, everything's in uh, capital. And if it's not capital, it's cursive. And I can't read a lot of his cursive. <laughs> and it's smeared. So it's taken a long time. And I thought between the two of us, he, she's actually putting the symbol erasing the, because it was on lined paper and pencil and smeared, so she's um, using Photoshop to take the, the symbol off of the, the smeared, the background. And so she's doing the symbols and I'm doing the typing. So between the two of us, uh, we're hoping to get a book out in 20, 2020. It was 2019, but I think in 2020 we'll have a, the first volume out. And I think it has to be done in volumes because he's got over 200 chapters in there on different variety of symbols from hands to walking to everything everything that has to do with the symbol it's going to have to be done in volumes mm -hmm. well i certainly <coughs> believe that anybody that spends time in front of petroglyphs anywhere can see the similarity mm -hmm. uh, anywhere you go in mm -hmm. the southwest at least mm -hmm. um, so did he say that the petroglyphs were similar to the sign language where it is. It's, it's actually, and I do, I have a PowerPoint that I give on the Paiute tribe, and I do mention that the sign language is um, the, what is written on the rocks. And I give signs, like, um, for instance, to go, to go up in sign is like this, and then I'll show a picture of a spiral. And then if it's going the other way, it'll show it going down. And then they all, uh, on the PowerPoint, I have a picture of a, it's just a zig, a, a pile of, um, in, in picture writing, it just looks like a pile of, or, or it actually looks like a Pueblo or something. So I explain every symbol and then I'll show the sign next to it. And there's a dot with a circle around it. And I'll say, if you go like this and hold your finger, it, there's a dot in the middle. And that means to hold. So in sign language, it means to hold. And so if you see that symbol on the rock, it means to hold. And so every symbol can be explained into a sign. And so it's just, it's fascinating. And I do teach a lot of the Paiute kids that um, sign language around the campfire and how a lot of the elders couldn't speak. And so everybody had to sign so they could understand. And I've, I've seen that growing up all the time. People would sign, whether they were deaf or not. It was just habit that when they would talk, I'm going over here, they would, their hands would just move. <laughs> so I thought that was fascinating. But now you don't even see that anymore. Oh, yeah. 
Very interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. All right. Um, can you talk a little more about the dance groups and the travels that you did with your sisters and your father? Yeah, because my dad had done it with the Boy Scouts, and then later on he did it with the, the Paiute tribe, um, some of his friends, and they went around and did that. Um, growing up, my dad, he, he taught us values of, because nowadays you can go and dance and compete, and you win money. And back in those days, uh, probably in the 70s, they had competition where, depending on what category you were in, they had a traditional uh, men's fancy, women's fancy, tradi uh, women's traditional. They had the different categories, and they would dance for money. So my dad says, I don't want you guys to dance for money because um, you're going to get it in your head that competing, it's all about competing. It's not about um, holding yourself up with pride. Because when you compete, you're so in a hurry to just make an outfit so you can go out there and be like your outfit. You want it to be flashy and you want to win. He says, I don't want you guys to be raised that way. So during our, our, our juniors and our teen years, we didn't compete. We would just go and dance. So we traveled everywhere just dancing, just, just for the fun of it. And then when we got in our late teens, um, there was a competition. Because we'd walk out. When they'd go stand up and have their number taken, we'd always walk out. And people would say, well, why are you guys walking out? You danced so well that you would have won that. You would have. So we were always told that. And so my dad said, well, uh, you guys have danced that long without money. That Go ahead. Uh, you guys can start competing because you have instilled in you that it's not all about the money. So we started dancing and we started making money and all of between us five sisters, we were making our own, our own cash to go and dance. And nowadays you can, it's like $1,500 if you win first place. So it's really become competition where you can make $1,000 a week just going off and dancing, depending on where you go. And I guess a lot of times who you know, now it's into politics where, well, this family's gonna pick that family because they know them. But, um, so you can make a living just dancing year-round. They have powwows in the winter, they have it in the summer, and so. Um, so we started going up to Canada, and a lot of the, they, they really liked our regalia because we tried to do it traditionally. Our dad taught us um, through the elders' teachings that they told us that you couldn't do things for money because it wouldn't turn out right. You couldn't sell things, like even medicines. He said They said never gather medicines and go sell it um, because it's not going to heal the person that, that that medicine is meant for. And so we learned the, that you had to learn things the hard way, the original way. And it may not have been hard back in the day, but if you compare now, it's hard. Like we had to learn how to make our own thread to sew. So we had to get the sinew off of the deer. We had to uh, strip the sinew, and then we had to rub it to soften it, and then we had to wet it between our, 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 in our mouth to wet it, and then we'd sit there and twist it. So we had to make our own thread, and they, the threads were maybe this long, depending on if you got a buffalo sinew, it would be a really long piece. So we had to make our own thread. We had to learn how to not use a needle we had to use a bone awl to make the hole to put the thread through. So we had to learn everything the hard way. We, we had to learn to quill before we could do beadwork because quill work was, was before bead, beads ever became, beads is glass, so um, that wasn't introduced until the 1800s. So <clears throat> we had to learn to quill. We had to learn how to dye the quills of different colors using natural berries and, and um, roots and leaves, everything. We had to learn from scratch. We had to learn how to gather the, the wolf moss and to boil it and make a yellow, but the yellow wouldn't turn out, so we'd have to mix different ingredients. And so we learned everything um, from the original way that, we, that people knew from hundreds and thousands of years ago. So after we learned that, then we moved to beadwork and needle and thread. And so, so we just knew the difference and we knew the time that it took to make something. And so we valued what we made. So we put a lot, my sisters and I put a lot of detail in it, all our beadwork. And so when we started going to powwows and dancing and competing, people would say that we stood out because our beadwork had had meaning or it had feeling or it had, it, it was just different. It wasn't done with sequins and flashy 
um, things to just catch your attention. It was done authentically to look like you just stepped out of the past. And so people started inviting us to different villages and said, can you come over and teach us? Or can you sh uh, do your dances and just show us the different things that you know? So we just started getting invited to some of the villages that you had to fly into up in Ontario and up north and all the way back east. <clears throat> so we would just do shows and then just a little presentation of our dancing. And then um, the school started inviting us and we would teach at the schools, mostly in the southwest. Um, during the, the winter times we would teach and we would uh, do anything from quill work to beating to flute to flute playing. And we had to learn how to make, I played flute um, when I was a teenager and then my other sister Jetta played flute. And so my dad says, well, because um, our first flute was given to us and it was, um, uh, we didn't make it. He says, well, if you're going to learn how to play flute, you got to learn how to make it the original way. So we had to go gather the wood and we had to learn how to hollow it out without metal tools. And so we learned how to do that. And <clears throat> so after a while, we would teach the other kids how to do it. And so we would go around to different schools, Indian schools, and just teach um, everything we knew. So we got a reputation of, of um, uh, the five sisters going around doing uh, arts and craft or cultural teachings. And then they'd have cultural camps in the summer and we'd go skin a buffalo and learn how to teach everybody how to use every part of the buffalo from the bone to the sinew to, to the bladder to make the, the water bags. And so we just learned. And so I try to teach now my kids, but it just seems harder because I don't travel as much and they pretty much stay put in one spot that a lot of times I think it's going in one ear, one ear and out the other because it just seems times have changed and it just seems harder to teach than so, from when I grew up. Um, in, the, in the autobiography, I said that you spent <coughs> quite a bit of time with the Apaches. Well, yeah, in my, down in San Carlos. Mm -hmm. or, and where is that located? It is 100 miles east of Phoenix and it's on the San Carlos Apache Reservation. And when I was let's see, in the 1970s, we moved to Las Vegas because my dad was doing the book and that's where the publisher was from. So we spent one year there. And then we moved to San Carlos when I was probably in the f second grade. And so he said he wanted to move us to a tribe that had, and, and in San Carlos Apache tribe has over 10,000 tribal members. And my tribe, the Shivwich tribe, um, there was only a few houses on the reservation. And he said he wanted us girls to to pick and choose our friends and not just pick who was there and say some of them might have bad influence, some may just drink and some may just do drugs. And so he didn't want us to, he wanted us to choose uh, between the more traditional people than just who was here. So he moved us from, from uh, the Shivwitz Reservation or in St. George to the Apache Reservation so that we could have a bigger variety of of friends, and so I was raised Apache <laughs> once we moved there. Um, I think I knew more Apache words than Paiute words, and so same with my sisters, and so we were raised Apache, and they were so traditional. The, the women there, some of them couldn't even speak English, and so um, we just, we lived down there my whole life until my dad got really sick, and then we moved home in 2000, and that was the year he passed away. So <clears throat> I was raised in Arizona along with my sisters on the Apache Reservation. And we learned everything from the way they cooked their acorns and how they gathered their roots and how they did their cradle boards. And so it didn't matter which tribe you were from. Like my dad told us that they're all family. So we had all of those good values being raised that, and we never grew up drinking. We never did drugs. Not one of my sisters and I ever picked it up. Even in our um, 20s and 30s, it was just something that, because we were raised so traditionally, that it wasn't um, where a lot of people, uh, they live in small communities and there's nothing to do. No teachings, no elders to teach you anything, so they turned to, to drinking or drugs or whatever they needed to do. But because our life was so full of traveling and wanting to, like, we spent the whole winter making outfits because the next year we wanted, for summer and competing, we wanted to have the best outfit. So we would spend our whole winter just making outfits. And so between my sisters and I all sitting around a table, we would just talk and we would tan hides. And so we grew up 
a, a close family. And we're still close today. Uh, there isn't a day goes by that not one of us isn't talking to each other. And so we were raised drug and alcohol free. And my dad always told us that if you wanted to drink, he says, you drink in front of me, you have a beer, that's fine. Um, but we didn't want to drink in front of our dads. <laughs> it was just something we never, why would we want to drink? It, it wasn't an interest to us. We were just so busy doing other things that, so by him moving us to a tribe where we had a lot of variety of friends that, that also didn't drink and do drugs. And so we were raised not wanting to experience any of that because they were out maybe picking roots or, you know, doing things that we had an interest in. So we, we our life was raised um, more traditional than the majority of the people now. One thing that I noticed in the autobiography <coughs> is that um, when you went to the Gallup inner, uh, the intertribal ceremonials in Gallup one time, evidently the, the Shivwit, you represented the Shivwits and the was that was my dad, something. yeah, and that was in the 1960s. It could have been the 1950s. And they won the mountain sheep. Uh, they, they did their mountain sheep dance. And they won that every year because it was unique. Nobody had ever seen dancers with the mountain sheep horns on and doing their little dance. And so um, they would always win that. And so that was announced that they were the least known uh, Paiute tribe or least known tribe in the, the whole United States. And I'm not sure back then how many tribal members just the Shivwits alone had, but today there's only 312. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and in the 1800s, there was over 800 to 1,000. And so they just all, through disease and um, uh, pioneers and in invasions and killings, that it just it dwindled down to, to hardly anybody. But yeah, we weren't. We're, and my dad always said that we may be, our tribe may be small, and one of the poorest tribes in the United States, but we had simple values. Uh, you know, a lot of the tribes, they have so many ceremonies and so many um, rituals that they have to go through every day that, which is good, and, I, and I've learned a lot of them, that we were just a simple people, the Paiutes were simple people that, um, that just lived every day, just, um, I, I'm not gonna say to survive, but we just lived every day a simple life and, and he thought that was like the most cleanliest, uh, beautiful thing is to see a tribe that just, just simple but yet beautiful in his eye. Well, let's go back. <coughs> I did have a question about the quill work, but he listening to this will know about bead work and all mm -hmm. that. But quill work is a little bit more, um, I mean, less known. So mm -hmm. can you give us the description of how quill work is done from beginning to end? Mm -hmm. Quill, quill work is from a porcupine, and the porcupine quills, like even to this day, we'll see a dead porcupine on the side of the road, and we'll pull over, and if it's fresh enough, we'll throw it in the truck, and we'll take it home and skin it, and we'll, we'll keep the quills off of it. But um, the porcupine quills, if you get the really long pieces, um, you, you can dye, dye the quills different variety of colors, and you flatten the quill, and when it's flat, you wrap it around, say, a rawhide, um, and it's, it looks like a flat stitch, and I'm not sure how to explain it, but you can make all kinds of designs. You can, there's different variety of ways to quill. You could do, like a stem of a flower is, a, is more of a curl stitch where it's just bent around each other to look just like a stem. And, there's another one where you use two, two it's a crisscross pattern. Um, there's a variety of ways to do a stitch in quilling, but that's how they did their designs. And they would quill, like the men's, the, the buckskin shirts, they had quill work here, they had quill work along their, their um, war bonnets. And so that was how they did their designs. <clears throat> now you do the beadwork, but back then, um, after you quilled it and designed your outfit, um, it would last a long time. Once the quill, after you flatten the quill and you use your fingernail and you'd flatten it, and if you soaked it, um, a lot of times my sisters and I would put it in our mouth. We'd cut the tip, tip off, of course, so it don't poke us, but um, just to, to soften the quill, just put it in your mouth for like a minute and it would soften, and then you would just um, start stitching and you'd have to bend the quill, and once the quill dried, it turned uh, hard 
and there was no way you can unbend that without re-getting it wet. So, so the quill work lasted a long time. It, it was a tough stitch, and the porcupine, um, you wouldn't think that a porcupine would have make such beautiful designs, but it, it does. And, and dyeing it alone was, was a challenge. We had to learn a variety of ways to keep the, the dye in, because a lot of times it just, like even blueberries, you'd think if you just throw blue, blueberries in with some quills, it would dye it blue. And it's not the case. It would dye it a, like a brown color, and so you'd have to learn how to mix your dyes. <laughs> but I, I think quill work, I still do it today. And quill work now is in demand, and quill work, even by the inch, sometimes is $100 if you do an inch worth of quill work. So it's, it's very pricey, and it's, it's valuable. It's, it's good to know, and I notice a lot of the young kids now are learning quill work. And back in the 90s, you hardly ever heard, knew anybody that could quill. But, so it's being brought back. If you get caught in the rain, does it come undone? Mm -mm. No, once that curl, once that, that it dries in a certain shape, and you get it wet, it's not going to uncurl itself, unless you've, the whole thing is soaked in water. But just getting rain splashed on it, it's not going to come uncurled. Mm -hmm. It stays a hard, almost like a cement. It cements itself into that shape. Wow. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, petroglyphs in this area, we have such an mm -hmm. enormous amount of petroglyphs in the St. George mm -hmm. region. Just almost everywhere you look, if you look for it, yeah. you can see petroglyphs yeah. everywhere. <laughs> and out by your uh, tribal mm -hmm. lands, there's so many on the way out there. Yeah, and my dad had said that in the 1960s, because that's when St. George started to grow, that Washington County was uh, the worst county in all of the United States for the destruction of petroglyphs and historical sites and cultural sites and digging up bones. And it, so St. George went through a period where there was a lot of destruction. And so I even heard that there is a newspaper, and I'm not sure what paper it was back in the, I don't know if it was the early 1900s, that was advertising that the freeway that went in over there going towards Walmart, that they had dug up so many bones that um, uh, it was in the paper that come over and sort through what you want to, just pick through whatever you want because we're gonna, we're gonna plow through that. And they were going through human remains to get pottery and beads, whatever they could, just it was advertised, come and get it before we move it away. So <clears throat> there was destruction all over St. George. And this area, um, there was a lot of history, a lot of, um, not just my band, Shivwitz band, but a lot of the Paiute bands would come. And they say, archeologists say that um, the Anasazis were here before the Paiutes. But our oral history says that we were always here. We were here when the volcanoes erupted. We were, we've never left here. But archaeologists say that, no, that was a different people. And so we'd ask them, where'd we come from? They said, I don't know, you guys just disappeared here um, so and so many years, not too long ago. Mm -hmm. But our history tells us, and there was an archaeologist up at the, oh, Mount Tremble that had found a pottery that had melted into a volcanic rock that you could see at the BLM office. Yes, you could see that. <laughs> yes, and after doing the, the studies on that, they found out, though, well, maybe you guys were here longer than we're saying. And just because uh, now when you look at the pictures that shows us in Wikiups, they oh, you guys always migrated. You guys were always um, uh, on the go. Like yeah, you were hunters and gatherers, so you never had a permanent structure. But they don't know that. We had elders. How could they travel year-round? We had permanent structures that they would stay here, and then the rest would travel to go with the season, to go pick pine nuts or to go up to um, Fish Lake to, get, to do their gatherings and get fish. And so, yeah, we did travel a lot, but we did have permanent structures. So they say we weren't Anasazi, but that was our people. And so we fight to this day for structures that are being destroyed and saying, well, that's not your people. And they, yes, it is. We're fighting to preserve and make sure that those bodies that you're digging up is, comes back to our tribe because those, are, those were my ancestors, whether you believe it or not. And so there was villages after villages throughout this whole valley 
and we're probably sitting on one right now, but it's just everywhere. And my dad, reading some of the history, like on the petroglyphs, in, on our reservation, there's a story of a lady, <laughs> a young girl. It's a picture of a parrot. And there's no parrots around here with a tuacon beak and, you know, a big, long beak. And he read that to us, and it said that um, because a lot of the, the Spaniards in the Spanish trial days um, would take a lot of the young kids and take them for slaves and sell them off down to Mexico. But that one Paiute girl escaped, and she made her way all the way back home, and she talked about that bird with the long tail and the colorful bird with the big beak. And there's a picture of it to prove that she found her way back. And so that there's a story. And so the petroglyphs all over here are written about everything from slavery to battles to um, land claims um, to just everyday life. So they're everywhere. And every time I see that there's a new development going up. It's just, it breaks my heart because I know that there was a, had to have been something underneath that at one time. Or, and then I hear stories that people, because you have to stop construction if you come across a bone. I've heard stories where they say, if you see bones, keep going. So I've heard many stories where there was a pile of bones that people just went through in the dump because they didn't want it to stop. So when I see this whole valley and all the destruction, it's just, it's sad to see because they've destroyed our history. Well, it's amazing <coughs> that we still have hundreds of petroglyphs, and, but yet hundreds have been lost. Yes. Thousands. And I have a lot that were destroyed. My dad had, had uh, taken, had recorded. He got the maps, he took the photos, and we'll go back and I'll see a new uh, a site come up like on the other side of the airport hill. I'll say, hey, there's houses there. So I'll go back and look at my dad's uh, maps and I'll say, yeah, there's petroglyphs that were there. I wonder what happened to them because it's private property. You, you don't know what they've done with the petroglyphs. Mm -hmm. I know if there's bones, you got to stop. But if there's a petroglyph, what are they doing with them? So I have a lot of the, the destroyed, the only, probably the only destroyed the, uh, the sites that I have the photos of. And that's all that remains. <clears throat> yes, I know uh, the preservation of the petroglyphs in this St. George City limits is, I think, something that is maybe high on their list of things. But I know that they've done a, in the last year, they did hire someone to do a complete survey of everything that remains. Mm -hmm. So at least they know what remains. And I was on council for eight years, and so I was the cultural resource manager, and so. Um, when I got on, the, a lot of times the, the different agencies didn't really work with the tribes. And my sister Doreen, is, she works for the Paiute Indian Tribe of Utah as a cultural resource manager. So our fields from growing up, we end up in cultural <laughs> because we knew a lot of the culture. So she's actually the main um, manager for all of the Paiute Indian Tribe of Utah. And so she said that a lot of the agencies weren't working with the, the tribal people. And I don't know if that was because the tribes just didn't, weren't aware that things were going on or they weren't being informed. Mm -hmm. So when I got on, I made sure that I, I read everything. And I says that, should we be signing this? And then I'd talk with my sister and she said, no, you, you don't have to sign it, but they have to consult with you. So through being in there eight years, we did a lot of changes. Now we work with the BLM really well, we work with forestry really well. And before that, I have no idea where, what happened to a lot of this stuff. And now the state works with us with repatriation. <clears throat> and we got some land where we can repatriate now. Um, so there's been a lot of changes. And now a lot of these kiosks where you go out to some of the sites that um, the BLM, uh, they would just look through the books and just pick what they wanted to put on there for history for us. And now they actually will write it up and send it to Dorian, And Dorian will send it to me and we'll read it over and we'll make changes. So they work with the tribes now, which is, oh, I, I'm so grateful because it was just like no, no communication between the different agencies, and now we, it's really changed. Mm -hmm. All right, well, let's, let's talk, the last thing on the list, about your father's uh, spiritual beliefs. I know he went through, his whole <coughs> life was a spiritual quest, mm -hmm. number one, mm -hmm. uh, and he went through several phases of different spiritual growth mm -hmm. and uh, I know that probably impacted you quite a bit. Yeah and our dad taught us well he told us that 
I'm not going to pick a religion for you. Um, you, if you, one day you want to go to a church, he says you can go to a church. I'm not going to stop you from doing what you believe in. But growing up, because of all the experiences he, he had with the spirituality and the and different paths he took, he learned, and that's why he left it up to us. But he, his, his dad was Mormon, and his uncles, they were all Jack Mormon. They, they were Mormon, but they didn't belong to the, or they didn't go every Sunday, or they, they just belonged to the religion. And so um, he was baptized, and his sister, he had a sister that was a year younger than him that was also baptized. So he, he grew up in the church. Um, and he did the genealogy in the church, and his first wife and him were married in the temple. And then his second wife, by then he'd, he'd pretty much backed off from the, from the, the Mormon church. But um, it was just the little things in the church. He said he did studies on religion, so he learned all about religion, all the different Bibles he read. And so he did a study for himself that through his travels, because he would hop trains and just uh, hop trains here and there and just get off and get work wherever he could, um, just to travel, just to see what it was like to travel around. But he would go into odd churches, uh, poor as he could, dirty as he could, and he would see who would accept him. And he just did that, just, just to see um, if they preach what they, they, they say. So a more majority of the churches would turn him away. And so he would just do this little study within himself to see how the different churches were and what they believed. And so he said that out of all of them, he said that he, he liked the Mormon church the, the best, he said, because of the, the things that they were taught. But because of all the discouragement of um, some of the branch presidents that were where he was, maybe in Richfield or different places and how they took advantage of the Indians. Indians were his number one priority, so when they would take advantage of them, it just became a hurt for him that how can this church do this to these people? And so he got discouraged with the church, so he just stopped going and um, it just, it was just the discouragement of it. But, so that's why he, he never let us go to church unless, well, my oldest sister was baptized and so was her sister that passed away. Um, because that, through that marriage, he was, he was married in the temple. So, but after that, when he married my mom, it wasn't through the temple or um, it was just a quick wedding. And so he just taught us that um, growing up that the, the Native American beliefs that, that every, we believe in a creator and you pray every morning. You wake up before the sun and you say your prayers and that everything has life. And there is no one place that you go to to worship the Creator or God. Um, it's everywhere. Every, every rock has life. Every plant has life. The water has life. The trees have life. So he, through the, the Native American teachings of, of um, religion, he found that that was the best church there could be was that you just, as long as you believed in the creator, creator, you didn't idolize any one thing. You only believed in him, that he found that um, the, the religion of just believing in God was the best one. So that's why he said, one day if you want to go to church, that's fine. I'm not going to stop you. <clears throat> he said that was just my experience. Was He was just discouraged. But the spirituality was the, the Paiute belief that we all believe in a creator and that everything has life. I know that in his book, um, in his autobiography, he does talk quite a bit about receiving signs mm -hmm. about the future or something. He, had a, he felt like he had a special gift to mm -hmm. be able to interpret those kind of things as mm -hmm. well. As, and that, that was quite interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I don't know. Um, I think being taught from a teenager about the Native American, the, the, I don't like to use the term Native American because we were here before America was America. Yeah. But when I talk to people, they understand what Native American is. So, so it's kind of a conflict for me to say Native American. I like the term Indian because I was raised knowing Indian. And my dad was the same way. He goes, well, we were called Indian when I was growing up, so <laughs> I'll just use that term Indian. But 
But growing up Indian um, and, and praying every day, he went on a fast um, where, like the Indians do, when they hit a certain age, they'll go on a fast, or when they're seeking a vision, they'll go on a fast. So he went on his vision, and he got his vision the first day. And the sun dances, he went to sun dances, and it, it's four-day sun dances where you get a vision while you're there because you're not drinking water or not eating. So you get uh, a vision through that. And so that's for the, the people that want, are seeking a higher, a higher, I don't know, a, they're expecting something more in life, or a lot of them are going because they want to become a medicine man and they're looking for teachings to become a medicine man. And so he didn't know it. He, I don't know if he was really lost, but he was seeking visions to see where his path was going because he was raised Paiute. He believed Paiute. He was Indian in his eyes. So he had learned a variety of the different spiritualities of seeking things that um, he became a healer for, for a short time and people would come to him and that he would heal them. And he never talked to us about that. It wasn't until years later I looked through his book and I found out that he was a healer, but he did tell us that, um, and he, he told us how we could heal. He, he told all my sisters and I that you can heal anybody from any sickness there ever is. And he says, you see, you see and you hear medicine men doing that. And in our tribe, um, my husband's tribe, the Moapa Band of Paiutes, there was a lot of healers there that could, um, had come up to Shivwitz and they'd healed little, like little kids that were dying they'd heal them. So healing was a big uh, spiritual level from uh, the average Indian. And so I don't know if he was seeking that when he would go off on his vision quest, but he could heal. People would come to him and he healed somebody of cancer. He healed, I, I've read some of his papers from that somebody else had written on him that he healed a lot of people, but he became discouraged because um, he didn't know if he was healing them for the right reasons or he was healing them for if they were good enough to be healed. You know, you get that conflict of should I be healing this person? Were they a bad person? You know, you get all those little conflicts. So I don't know why, but he quit. He quit healing and he told us how to heal. But uh, my sisters and I says that we're, we're not on that level to become a like a medicine woman or to, to be able to do that. So he just taught us to heal through... Um, the different medicines and to gather and things like that. But he was very spiritual and he, I, I think that's why we were raised the way we were was that as long as we believed in the creator, um, that we were untouchable. Like uh, there wasn't anything that could touch our family. And we had a lot of, um, I don't know if you'd call it witchcraft or jealousy or bad medicine that was was aimed at my family and it was just like a barrier was around us and we always made it through and um, we always my dad seemed to always know he was always one step ahead of what people were wishing bad on us or he knew something bad was going to happen and and I think I kind of got that that um, with me inside me like I'll know when something bad's gonna happen and I, I won't go say say I'm supposed to go to Arizona tomorrow one time I did that and I had this bad feeling that oh I can't go so I didn't go and that feeling washed away and so I think my dad taught us that you have to look within uh, stop and look at what your surroundings don't just go through life so there's a spirituality in his teachings that passed on to us that that it's just as long as you believe in the Creator and don't idolize anything else that um, you'll live a good life. Well, very interesting. <clears throat> um, so is there about your some remembrances of your father other than the, what we've talked about? Any um, particular memory you might have had with just between you and he, something that, that you treasured? remembrance that you have of him or something that you'd like to share? Well, I know when he was uh, going all over the United States, especially in the spring, after school would get out, and then, um, um, I mean, the summertime and the fall, he was going to petroglyph sites 
that were impossible to get to. And being young, we had to pack along his little notebook and his camera. And, and growing up, my sisters and I says, oh, we hated those trips. So we just had to go everywhere. So we pretty much climbed every rock, every canyon, every hill. So growing up, we didn't like that. But now that we look back, I go, oh, I guess I did go there. I did go there. And so I don't see it now as, um, as bad as then because you're walking 113 degree weather. And my dad always taught us that you don't take water with you, that if uh, he, he taught us the different plants and the, the elders taught us the different plants, that there's, there's ways to, to get what you're, you're needing as you're hiking. So I just remember it growing up that oh, I don't want to go on another hike. <laughs> it was just hard. But... And, and it didn't seem like I learned anything because he would tell us um, <clears throat> things about the rocks. Oh, look, this rock means that. Or, or, and then he'd say, go ask your, the, the elders that didn't know that. Go ask them. See what they say. So these things that I didn't think I, I, I remembered until my dad passed away. And um, the BLM in Las Vegas asked me to come and do a talk on, on my dad. And it was about a canyon, Sloan Canyon, that they were going to, um, I don't know if they were going to make it a park or, or what, but I guess they were needing information on it. So they sent me a whole bunch of pictures, and they said, could you do a lecture on this? And I thought, well, I don't know what I'm going to say, but I'll go and I'll talk about my dad. But when I got there, <coughs> and the, they were showing the slides, and it just seemed like all the things that I didn't know I knew, I. I guess I did retain it. And so you think going through life that, oh, I should have listened to this, to that. But I did learn a lot. And I remember my dad telling me <clears throat> probably in the 90s that um, out of all my daughters, you're the only one that's going to carry all of this through. And so he didn't feel bad that well, he was getting sick back in the late 90s because he had cancer and that's what he died from. But <clears throat> he said that. Um, I feel that you're the only one that's going to carry this through. So all this work that I'm doing isn't going to be in vain. And so, but I did. I let it go 18 years. I had it in storage, and I keep thinking back to my dad that he told me I'm going to do this, but it's just sitting there. And so I got off council. It was it was a good for eight years, but it, it's real stressful, and there's a lot of negativity being on council and so I say I'm stress-free now and I can do this because this is my new path so mm -hmm. so uh, I, I retain more than I, I actually thought I'd, I he had taught us the same with the elders because a lot of times we'll be sitting there and I'll tell my sister that <clears throat> do you remember how to do a certain thing and they'll say no and one will remember so we all through life pick up different remembrances and between us sisters we just seem to um, carry each other through of what we learned through our life in our dad's teachings and and we were raised by our dad and it's just funny how he was an Indian but we were raised Indian and our mom would tell us that well I have to ask you because you know more than I do <laughs> because she wasn't she went to boarding school and she lived on the reservation she didn't really travel and there was no elders to teach her because her mom and dad died when she was young so um, she says, you guys know more Indian than me. And that's the, the thing with uh, a lot of the tribal people that we don't want our kids to lose that. So any chance we get, I say my door's open. You can come and learn whatever you want from deer hides to, to tan them, to skin them, to anything. And I, my dad taught me arrowhead, how to do arrowheads. <clears throat> and he was showing me a move one time and I sliced into my finger here and it opened right up to the bone. So after that, I says, I ain't going to do it no more. <laughs> and so now my son, he's 15, he goes, Mom, I know you know how to make arrowheads. When are you going to teach me? He goes, because he never met his grandpa. He goes, um, my grandpa has all these rocks here. And, and he said, they're just sitting there waiting for me to, to make something out of. So, so he's at that age now. Well, I told him in our tribe and in most Indian tribes that the, it ain't a grade level. You can't say now you, have, you only learn things when you hit a certain grade. When you're growing up and you want to learn how to do something, I don't care what age you are, you teach them if they want to know it. So he wanted to know it back when he was like seven. <laughs> and I to this day haven't taught him. So I feel bad that the teachings that I did, I'm not passing on like I should be. So how <clears throat> many um, descendants does your dad have as far as grandchildren? How many grandchildren are there? 
Um, my oldest sister, Dorina, she has two boys, mm -hmm. and uh, her oldest has two, two, um, two little girls. And Carmen, she had a son, but he passed away. He had a, a muscle disease that they say they don't live very long. So she adopted two kids recently. She has a four-year-old and a one-year-old. And then my sister, Jetta, has two kids, a boy and a girl. And then I have two boys. Mm -hmm. And my dad, and one thing that my dad taught me that I listened to <laughs> was that he, most people nowadays, they wait till they retire, then they'll go see the world. Mm -hmm. He told us, he says, you see the world before you have kids mm -hmm. and then settle down. So I didn't have kids till I was in my late 30s. So my kids now are teenagers. And, but um, he says that. And he does that, mention in his uh, autobiography that you and your sisters have traveled over the whole, around the whole world. Yeah, my sister Carmen and I, she was the world traveler. She read every book. Through her whole life, she was reading books all the time. And one day she said, um, she goes, save money. We're going to go travel around the world. And she goes, you start thinking, because it was in the summer. She said, think of all the places, countries you want to go to, and I'll add it to all the countries I want to go to, and we'll go to a, um, a travel agency, and we'll just pick the countries. So we picked 39 countries between the two of us. And, well, not 39 countries. We went 39 days, and we picked all the countries that we wanted to go to, and it was around the world. We end up in China was the last one, and then back home. But um, that's what my dad said. He says, you see the world and do everything you want to do, because when you retire, who's to say you're going to get sick and you won't be able to do it? You do it while you're young. So we did. And then we went all over as a family. We went down to Yucatan, Belize, um, Mexico City. We performed down there. Tar Hamara, we, we hiked, and we had a pack course. We went down to Tar Hamara country. We danced for them. So we've been from coast to coast, um, whether it was dancing with my family or, or um, now uh, just traveling just to see the different cultures. And that's, that's my passion is to see the different cultures. So I like to just go and just to learn from them but, and to teach my kids all of that. But we've been every single state, every, every, everywhere but Alaska, mm -hmm. just teaching and just learning. and so. I've, we've had a full life. <laughs> mm -hmm. Very interesting. <clears throat> well, I think that we'll stop for today. Uh, well, I, why, why did your mom leave your dad? Um, sh there was a turkey plant up here that she would go to work at, and she found some other guy up there, and I guess she got pregnant, and so he, she just wrote a note to him and said that, um, when you read this, I'll be gone, so she moved to Tucson somewhere. And so it wasn't until a year later she came back, she had her baby, and she said she was trying to take all her kids. And my dad said no, and he had to write a letter. She had to write a letter saying she wasn't going to take any of us. But she did take me to go visit. And then when I came back, I was being mean to my dad and saying, um, well, you know, because uh, she was trying to put my dad against me or to, to take the kids. So she wrote a letter that says she won't ever try to fight for custody of us. So um, my dad got full custody of us but she just found somebody else. So I have other siblings, half siblings. I have um, two other sisters and a brother from, from my mom's side. And what tribe is she from? Here, Shivwitz Paiute. Okay, so do you keep in touch with her? She passed away at a young age. She was 45, she had diabetes, and pretty much everybody on my tribal side is diabetic, and they're all dying of diabetes. And so I don't have it. Our dad taught us, luckily, to avoid the things to eat and be more traditional. So who's to say I could still get it, but <laughs> try to live a healthy life. Well, thank you so much for coming mm -hmm. in today and bringing all this wonderful information about your tribe mm -hmm. and your father and his life. And uh, I think we'll stop for today. And hopefully we could meet maybe Thursday. And I do have one other short inter shorter interview I'd like to do with you about just the Paiute tribe, tribal history, period. Not about your dad, not about, but tribal, Paiute tribal history as you know it. Just give me, just like, I'll just ask you to just start from where you think 
the beginning was of your tribe down to now. <laughs> I know, and I'm thinking, and I don't know dates. I don't know. Um... Well, just in general, it's just a generalized, mm -hmm. you know, just a generalized, because I've heard so many things about how the Shivlets got their land there, mm -hmm. but they really, they're really native traditional land right <coughs> on the edge of the Grand Canyon, mm -hmm. and they were moved there, and you know, all that, and I don't know that that's, you know, we, uh, we ought to get something mm -hmm. down about that. I, I know it's written somewhere, and when I was on council, I had the paper that it was written on, but I never learned the dates. I never learned the acreage that was given and mm -hmm. all of the little details like that, but um, my PowerPoint I do now for, for the public and for the schools is on the whole, tr the tribe as a whole. Mm -hmm. How many bands there are, how many states they live in, the population, the foods they ate, there, it's like a culture gram mm -hmm. that the schools have for er, every culture in the world. Mm -hmm. It's based off of that, marriage life, um, foods and health and um, commerce. So it's based off of the tribe as a whole. But as for the Shivwitzman, I guess I could do some research and get dates. And well, just, the, <laughs> just in general, the general history of how your tribe got the land there mm -hmm. and how it what's happened over the years since you got moved onto that land. You know, I know that you lost, you lost tribal designation and you received it mm -hmm. back and all this sort of thing. It's very interesting types yeah, of history. I can get uh, I don't know, sure. you, would you be able to come again on Thursday mm -hmm. morning for a, an hour? Okay, and then we'll, we'll just do that. And then um, you maybe could maybe see if you want any of this. I do have this to give to you, if it's okay with you, to put into the, mm -hmm. you know, it's a copy of his actual autobiography, if, if it's okay with mm -hmm. you. Yeah, and I don't have anything copyrighted, but I know you did mention in there about his books that he did. He has a book on um, uh, how to make bows and arrows mm -hmm. and arrowheads, and he has a sign language book that he did. And like I said, they're not copyrighted, but because this is my new business now is to, mm -hmm. to go through this, I'm going to publish the sign language. Mm -hmm. um, not sure about the, the, the bow and arrow making because there is a lot of secrets in there that mm -hmm. I know when he asked the, the, the Indians the secrets, they said not to share it. So mm -hmm. I'm having trouble on should I share that because it's lost now and nobody knows it. <laughs> why, why, would, why, why is it secret? Is well, back in the day... Um, Paiutes were well known for their arrowhead making. They made mountain sheep horn bows, and their mountain sheep horns are curled. So to uncurl that bow, I mean that horn, and to, to make it flat is a secret in itself. And to make it so that when you pull it, it's not going to break is a secret in itself. So they would trade with the other tribes that were warring tribes, and because we were a peaceful tribe, um, they were secrets that they never shared with any of the other tribes because... Um, they were skilled at it, and all the tribes came to them because they wanted to know their, their they wanted it, yeah. So because it was a secret that now is lost, and we're not a warring tribe, and no, none of the other tribes are warring tribes, um, should I reveal that? Because you know it's the mountain men that are going to want to learn it, and they're the ones that are going to learn it, and are they going to give credit to the Paiute tribe? Mm -hmm. Or are they going to say, this is what I learned, hard work, and... I learned it all on my own, so I don't like that idea of, of them not giving credit where it's due. Mm. So that's why I'm not yeah. sure. It, it, I could digitize it and give it to the tribal kids to learn, because I do teach that. I, I do teach a lot of the arrowhead making, and, and you know, they, they cook some of the stones in the, the ground. He talks about that, the temperature that it needs to be, and how far down in the ground, and all those little details. So. Mm -hmm. He did the complete book, but I'm just maybe it'll just be for tribal eyes, mm -hmm. uh, sure. so I'm not sure. But sure. but you know, uh, you know, uh, only the things that you think you'd like to have mm -hmm. stored here that would be important to have archived professionally, you know, by. See, I'm not worried about yeah. that. I, I'm going to get it yeah. published, so I don't need it archived if I'm going to publish it. Yeah. Well. Ideally, um, once you've got published, the originals in his research notes would then still be available. Mm -hmm. um, those are important primary documents that I would, I would hate to see lost. Mm -hmm. um, 
we do have the benefit here that we're open to everybody. Um, you can put restrictions as far as time. Um, restricting to certain people, however, is difficult for us to do because we're a public institution. Mm -hmm. We need to be open to the public. Yeah. Um, but we can kind of, you know, request that, and we do request that anything that's used from our collection is cited as from this source um, to try and, you know, make sure that everybody knows it's from the Paiute Band mm -hmm. instead of just, oh, well, I discovered this all the way out. Mm -hmm. that, that's a very legit concern <laughs> and that we do deal with as well. Mm -hmm. um, but it's entirely up to you because I realize there are some things that are sensitive and you maybe don't want to share it outside of the mm -hmm. band or the, maybe the whole tribe. So, and, and that's where I'm touchy at too because when my dad passed away, I had a lot of uh, the, the colleges come after or saying they were going to come after me and take everything because my dad had willed it to them and I knew that wasn't true. And so my sisters and I, we took everything that he ever had and we put it in storage and we hid it there for five years, thinking that people were going to come and get, get all of his stuff. So I don't want to part with any of it. I don't want it archived. I don't want it mm -hmm. out of my sight. It's in my family and it's going to stay in my family. In that case, um, I might have suggestions on how to store it mm -hmm. so that it is preserved. Yeah, and, and we've been uh, putting it in those acid sleeves. Now everything that is one of a kind like all of his pencil stuff, we are filing them and putting them okay. in the proper okay. way. Once I digitize them, then I, then I so protect them. Them. Yeah. them. And so that's the only, the only issue I have. And he did a book on, Book of Reality, he calls it. And throughout his life studies, he's written down poems. He's written down um, phrases of his, his experiences in life. So he talks about love. He talks about war, you know, it's just like a whole chapters of different varieties that he's done little sayings for. Mm -hmm. And that's like a really thick book. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that I don't know if I'll ever get published, but um, it's just something to read once in a while. That mm -hmm. It's his beliefs. I may not believe all, especially when it comes to love and marriage. I don't believe a lot of the stuff he wrote in there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah. so I don't know if I'll ever publish that one. But And, and it's more things like this, like he's got original, especially on his side. <clears throat> his side of the family, he's got original marriage documents in here and <clears throat> original writings, old newspaper articles and letters, love letters. And so this is Pictures. the only thing that mm -hmm. if anything's going to be mm -hmm. preserved, it's going to be that. And I haven't, because the book is so thick, I, unless I'm looking for a genealogy through here, I just, I haven't really, we don't really touch it. Who, and who put those books together? My dad did them. <clears throat> and he had my mom uh, write her whole history. So she wrote a whole pencil, two pages of her, what she can remember. So he was good at telling them, you need to preserve whatever you learned growing up. After their divorce? No, when they were married. Right from day one, he says, can you write about your, your, what you remember about your dad, your mom? So he was in here writing it. And so through, we like to look at this one because my, my sons are always curious and we're related to Charlemagne, we're related to the Bruce of Scots. Bruce of Scots is my 24th grandpa. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we're related to the queens and kings. And so <laughs> this one, he says, uh, they say you can date back to Adam and Eve. And so he's got, he's, he knows how to keep his history on his side. Mm -hmm. And then when it comes to this side, um, we can only go back to three grandpas or grandmas and that's it. Mm -hmm. There's nothing before that. So this one is a little more... Not as much. <clears throat> I've always wondered that with the petroglyphs. Like, it would mm -hmm. be nice if you could get a name mm -hmm. out of it somehow. Mm -hmm. You know, if you yeah. know who that person is. Or and they do. They have names in there. Yeah. Uh, and you know, back in the day, people are named for objects and, mm -hmm. and the wind and lightning and animals. So my son is named, his nickname is Bear. So I say if we were to write about you on the rocks, we would just show a bear. And whatever you're good at, you would have a skill. So, so names would be easy to find out, <laughs> mm -hmm. because back then their names were all all kinds of names. <laughs> so, did like the uh, like the longhorn sheep or something? Does that represent a person? It re it represents the people, and in Paiute, our we don't call ourselves Paiute. We call ourselves Nuwu, which means the people. 
And so when you're talking about the people, you show mountain sheep. Mountain sheep is who we are. And so if you see a whole trail of mountain sheep, it's talking about us going on a trip or a family going somewhere. Or So it talks about the people. So you see a lot of mountain sheep, petroglyphs yeah. around, yeah. Mm -hmm. Especially over in that, um, we went to go take pictures over at the Valley of Fire area. It talks a lot about mountain sheep, and there's a lot of mountain sheep over there. <clears throat> and I actually did an article on it. I, uh, I actually got my first publication through one of the Italian magazines on my interpretations. Because I, I always say I don't like to follow in my, I don't like to use my dad's name to, to make myself known. Like, my dad did this, or my dad did that. I want to become my own person and not follow in his shadow. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> I use his name, but because I learned a lot of stuff from my elders mm -hmm. about the writings and the sign language, and, and he led me on the right path to these things. So when I did my first um, paper on the, the petroglyphs over at the, the Nevada area, my husband's area, I, I talked about um, how I believed or how I was raised. And I say, and I give my dad credit, but mm -hmm. I didn't say he wrote it and I didn't say this is his words. It's my own writing and my own words. So, mm -hmm. And then when I see pa petroglyphs, I see things that my dad may not have seen. Mm -hmm. I see it more through an Indian eye than he did because he was white. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, I hear people say that I think you would learn it quicker than your dad did took him 40-something years. He says that if I really studied, I probably could learn it quicker. Mm -hmm. So uh, I see things now when I look at petroglyphs, and I go, oh, I know what that means. I, I, I already know I could read a lot of that. But I don't like to share it because I might be wrong. Like, I'm still nervous, and <laughs> I'm not 100% sure of certain things. But it, it's, it's getting interesting where I'm, I'm getting that passion where I want to learn. So I wrote my first paper and it got published, so I'm excited about that. <laughs> Thank you. Where is your husband from? He's from Wapa, <clears throat> where the Valley of Fire is. Is he Indian? Mm -hmm. He's the chairman for the Wapa Band of Paiutes until oh. December. They're, they're, they're doing elections. So he doesn't want to run again. He said he's done. <laughs> Tribal politics is too much. <laughs> so he's got one more month and he's counting down the days. <laughs> <clears throat> He's a singer. He sings salt songs, which is uh, songs that are only sung for the dead. And it's a salt song trail that when your spirit dies, it goes on its own journey. And the songs help you as you're going on that journey. And you're being led by the Creator through a trail that takes a long, all night to do. And so he sings those songs, and there's over a hundred and something songs. And so when somebody dies, Starting at 7 o'clock, they start singing songs, and then it's over about 5 in the morning. So I met him because one year on our reservation, we had death after death after death. So I kept seeing him coming there every more, every, like pretty much every two weeks. He would come to the reservation with a lot of the other singers. <clears throat> and my cousin, he was the lead singer, and he was telling my husband that, um, was kept looking at me because I was the cook and you know I'd help with the breakfast and stuff and he was saying nope she's out of your league you're never gonna get her <laughs> and so I he came to me one day and asked me to if I had buckskin and I said yeah because I had tanned hides he said do you think you can make me a gourd bag which was a just a buckskin bag and I said yeah so that's how we started talking <laughs> Yeah, very interesting. So can we, would it be all right with everybody if we met again Thursday morning, 10 o'clock again, and just have a, a, just like a less than one hour? Mm -hmm. little, I, think, I think that would be great. Um, and there's also suggest if you got on Friday about this room book. I think it would be great to get an interview with just your history. Because we talked about your dad, we're talking about the tribe. Mm -hmm. But you also seem like you've been involved in pretty much all stages of politics, the cultural aspects of it. I think that would also be good if you're willing. <laughs> yeah, I could give um my my um I was raised dancing mostly, so I was just raised more um traveling and dancing, but then of course I know a lot of the cultural stuff. So yeah, I could I could find something to say. <laughs> I mean do you do you feel like now that you're 
kind of getting back into it that this, this kind of stuff is happening because you're you've made the decision to kind of pursue things, get your dad's books back out. I think so, and I'm getting a lot of uh, overseas because you know in the United States there's a lot of these these groups here that um, these rock art groups that didn't like my dad. Um, they didn't like the interpretation that say no, it's art. How can you be reading something? But yet they turn around and read it and say that oh, it's a solstice. And I go well, if you can't if it's art, how do you know it's a solstice? So so lately I've been getting a lot of people from overseas contacting me, wanting to 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 do papers and to do articles and to talk about my dad because they believe it. They don't consider it art as much as they do over here. So, so I, yeah, I've had a lot of opportunities and doors have been opening because I'm getting more into it now. And because of the dictionary book that I'm writing, um, or not writing, but working on, then I, I'm getting a lot of new opportunities. So that's why I, I'm starting my Martineau archive so that I can do, um, Videography, you know, he's, we did record a lot of stuff, um, travels, um, want to do some publications, want to do some of my own publications, and people say I should write my own history, like my dad did, the autobiography, yeah. but I don't know, that's, that's like down, way down the line. Even my husband says that. Yeah. You know a lot, that's interesting, you should write a book, and I go, I don't know if I want to write them about myself. <laughs> in his autobiography that he made some videos, <coughs> early, early videos yeah. uh, that were shown for, I don't know what, what but do you have copies of all those? Yeah, books? you know how VHS was, yeah, VHS. <laughs> quality so poor. VHS, <laughs> and I've actually, I have masters, but I also made copies of some of them. So we did some on our groups, our dance, uh, dance trips um, down in Belize, um, Yucatan, up in Canada, so we've done, and he narrated every one of them. He liked to talk, so, which was good because he would, he would explain where we were, what we did. So even on videos, he was real detailed. <laughs> not like, not like uh, now you just put a title over something and say, this is your location. But he was talking so through the whole thing. So I have all of them, yeah. I don't know about protected. They're probably just laying in high. Uh, <clears throat> I did. I need to put. In, I need to digitize them because a lot of them are still VHS. But uh, and then I moved to, to beta. No, we didn't move to beta. We moved to eight, high eight. Today is November sixteenth. Uh, we are here at the Dixie State University Library, and um, through a grant from the Washington County Historical Society. We are recording um, some of the oral history and information of uh, Shenandoah Martineau Anderson and her family. And uh, here in the room today is uh, myself, Susanna Nelson, representing the Washington County Historical Society, and uh, Shenandoah Martineau Anderson. And Kathleen Broder, Special Collections Librarian at DSU. And Mike Gardner, videographer. All right, very good. Uh, today's um, goal is to talk a little bit about the actual Southern Paiutes. This is the book that uh, Shannon's uh, father wrote, and with the help of Shannon, uh, wrote about the Southern Paiutes, about their legends, lore, language, and lineage. And um, we want to talk particularly about the history of uh, the Southern Paiutes and particularly about the um, one group of Southern Paiutes that live in the St. George area called the Shibwit. So we're going to turn some time over to Shannon to just give us an outline of what she knows about that. Well, I am from the Shibwit's Band of Paiute. The original word for our Shivwitz band in Shivwitz is broken English, but the real term is Sivitsing. Sivitsing means um, whitish earth people because we lived out on the Shivwitz plateau and the, the, the dirt out there was more white colored than you see here in Santa Clara uh, along the river, which is a reddish toned dirt. So um, Sivitsing was our, our band name. Um, our Paiute name that we called ourselves was uh, is Nuwu, 
Um, it varies among the different bands. Some say Nuwavi, some say Nungwu, but it all means the people. So we're known as Nungwu or Nuwu, which is the people. And in Utah alone, we have five bands. We are the, the furthest band to the south. Um, up in Cedar City, Utah, there's the Cedar Band. There is also Indian Peaks Band. And Kanash Band is up north of Cedar. And then we have Richfield, we have Kusharam. So those are the five bands of Utah. And I have statistics here which says, um, Actually, that's for the whole band. Ours is the largest of the five bands in Utah. We range about 312, and the Cedar Band is just below us. They're just right, well, right behind us. They're just over 300. So in total in Utah, there's about 800 uh, tribal members remaining in all of the, the five bands. Well, tell us, now there are very closely related bands also in Nevada, though. Yeah, in uh, Nevada we have Two that are federally recognized, that's the Moapa Band of Paiutes and the Las Vegas Tribe, which is um, a break off of the Southern Paiute Bands. And there is the tribe over at Pahrump, which is still fighting for federal status. There's quite a few band members over there, but right now they have no recognition with the government as a tribe. And there was a lot of tribal members that was in the Ash Springs area. Um, the Paranagat Valley area that never did get tribal status also, but um, just the two bands right now in, Los, uh, in Nevada. And also in Arizona, there's two tribe, there's two bands. There's the Kaibab Band of Paiutes and the San Juan tribe, which is surrounded by the Navajo tribe. So um, in total, we have just under 2,000, I think close to 1,800. I think that's what I wrote, yeah, 1,893 right now. Well, that changes depending on how many tribal enrollments we get, but it's just under 2,000 total. Okay. Tell us a little bit about um, what you know about your, you know, origin stories or what, just kind of the history of the, the people as a mm -hmm. whole. The, Southern Paiutes have always been here. We have no other story of us migrating from anywhere. We've always been on this land. Uh, our, our origin story is from Mount Charleston, which is in Las Vegas. That is where um, we were here when the big flood came that all of the, the world has stories about the flood. We also have, have legends about the flood where when the water rose that the back then when the animals were people we call them we call them legends because we say that the animals at one time were the people that talked and walked and so um, Mount Charleston is when the flood hit was where all the animals went that survived which is the southern Paiute people so our stories go all the way back to there so Mount Trumbull is a sacred place to all of the southern Paiute people we also have been southern Paiute a Southern Paiute band from California, which is the Chimwevi band, and they're also Southern Paiute. Forgot to mention them, but they they speak the same language. Everything they just because they're in California, they're just considered a whole new tribe on their own, which they they are under federal recognition. <clears throat> um, we have all kinds of legends of uh, volcanoes and his historical facts throughout all of. The, the three states, the four states. Um, so we've always been here. Our particular band, the Shivwitz Band, currently today we have just over 28,000 acres, which is just um, just outside of St. George and uh, just past Ivins. We have 28,000 acres and we lived right along the Santa Clara River there and we had, were the first band in Utah to get um, federally recognized as a tribe. We were the Shivwitz tribe in 1891. We had federal recognition and it wasn't until the 1920s that the other four bands got federally recognized through the government. But we were the first and back then I, I don't know the statistics how many, how many tribal members we had but we were all placed on the reservation that we have now, we were all placed there 
because we lived way out in Shivwitz, all over the plateau, everywhere. And, and the Mormon settlers didn't like us being scattered and because cows would go missing or they, we were always accused. Yeah, I'm sure they took some of the cow, cattle that were there to feed on because it was harder and harder in the 1800s to, to roam free because of all the settlements that came in. And so starvation had hit in at uh, certain times of the year. Um, even though we did live in the desert and we knew all of the, the foods and the medicines and where the waters were, it was still a tough time because of the settlers that had moved in. So they had moved all of the remaining Shivwitz people onto the reservation that we have now and uh, to keep a close eye on us. And they put a BIA office out there. And, and so we were pretty much had to stay in one place. We couldn't live and wander out like we had done before and live where we normally lived out in the mountains and the deserts. So we were placed um, on the Shivwitz Reservation there, which was owned by a farmer. And he had leased the land out to us for to live on. And in the 1950s, the government had taken, had stripped our recognition away for all of the bands, our band, including the other four bands in Utah. And so we weren't federally recognized anymore. And they say because of that recognition, the government had stopped providing us with the necessities because we couldn't go out and hunt like we freely could before. So um, they say it was a hard time. It was hard. We did have the water because it was along the river, but they said it was a, it was a tough time because all of the medical um, uh, help that they had received before was gone and um, a lot of the rations that they had received was gone. So they say it was a tough time. My people say it was a tough time, but um, that's because the government made us depend on them so much that when they took away that, that right, then it was, a, it was a struggle for a while. And so between the five bands, it took, it took a lot of years, but in 1980, we finally got that recognition back in, in April. And so um, we now have a restoration uh, celebration for when that recognition was returned. And per personally, myself, I, I don't like being under the government. I say we're a ward of the, ward of the, we're children of the government, like a ward of the government, and I don't like that status. Like, I, I don't care less if we were under the government or not, but I know it has helped our people. It has helped um, with a lot of the grants. And, and I, I was in tribal council for eight years, so I've seen all of the, the, the rules that we have to follow and the regulations we have to follow. They say that's our 28,000 acres, but yet, we don't have permission to do what we want with it. We still have to go to the BIA, which is the Bureau of Indian Affairs, to ask permission, can we build on this or can we do that? So we're always gonna be under the government. We're always gonna to have to ask permission. So that land isn't ours. Even though they've slapped a title on it that says it's reservation land, we still have to get permission. So I don't like being under the government because it's just, um, we're still being told what to do. And that's just my personal opinion. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of the other um, tribal people couldn't do without it or couldn't live without it and I don't like getting grants myself personally because to me that's just asking the government for one more thing to to survive and they've made it hard for us to survive I am married into the Moapa band of Paiutes and my husband um, says that every time they try to succeed or get a uh, money on their own without grants to start businesses the state is always um, pulling them back down, saying that, well, we don't want to give you this permit or we don't want to give you that because every time the, the tribes start to make money, they find a way to bring you back down. It's like they don't want any of the tribal people to succeed. And so it's always been a struggle and it always will be um, as long as we're under federal recognition. And I've heard of a few tribes across the United States that want to remove that government assistance so that they can claim that land as their own and do what they want. and. I know when casinos came in, everybody says you're a casino tribe now, you're making all that money, but you know how long it was to get money to these tribal people without being under the government? So it, it's every time the tribe succeeds in making a business, then they're put down for it or they're tried to put, be brought back down. So it seems like we can never succeed as a, as a government owned people. So, but that's just my personal opinion. Like I said, I was on there for eight years. <clears throat> And I quit and well after the I had four year terms. So after the two four year terms, I, 
I just said I was done. It was just time to move on. Uh, we did quite a bit for our people. We helped. Uh, I say we because my sister was also on there. She was our vice chair the first four years and our chairman for the, the, the last four years. So I think we did a lot of changes and we did a lot of things to succeed. And so um, as far as our Shivwitz band, the, when the rancher had, had given us that land uh, on a lease, and I'm not sure what year, I, I know it could be found. We had a website up, but that was taken down. But um, one of the ranchers came to us when we had lost recognition back in the 50s that they were taxing that land and that they were going to take all of that leased land away if we didn't start paying taxes on it. And so one of the ranchers, and I can't think of the name, had paid the taxes for us and we fought to get that land in under our own name. And so. It was finally um, granted as Shibwitz Reservation land, and so we, that's how we got that. And then years later, while I was on term, they had given more land. Uh, the government had given a few more acres to the Shibwitz. So every chance we get, we try to buy what we can back. But right now it's 28,000, and it is the largest in Utah. So we're proud of what little land we do have remaining. Even though when I look out, no matter where I look, I see, I see our tribal lands that's just been uh, developed and um, it's still our land, even though it's, we don't have permission to go on it anymore. <clears throat> that's so true, yeah. Very, uh, the five bands in Utah, you have the largest acreage. Mm -hmm. The other ones have very much smaller. Very little, little, and they even fought for that. And I know that Joseph, over in Joseph, Utah, they fought for that little bit of land, and it's just right along the freeway. They give you undeveloped land, hoping you'll never uh, prosper. Mm -hmm. So they give you the, the barrenness, dirt, the, the land that they think that you're never going to achieve anything on because it's just land that nobody wants. So the, they got some land back that nobody wanted. Mm -hmm. And um, Indian Peaks had some land north of Cedar City, and I think that's turned into a reserve now. I'm not sure how that happened, but... Um, the, every, all of the bands got a little piece of land back. Not much, but little, whatever they can get is, is good, I know that. Okay, I have a question about the pie in the Paiute. Mm -hmm. Is that because you are cousins to the pie people that ring around the Grand Canyon? All those pie Indians, that Walla pie and the Sioux pie mm -hmm. and all those pie Indians. You know, they actually have a gathering of the pies, mm -hmm. they call it, and um, I'm not sure how every one of them got their names. There's been a lot of controversy on how the Paiutes got their name. They say it was uh, the Spaniards that named it. They say the Utes named it because uh, in each language, and I don't have the breakdown of it. Um, I know Dorina Wood, she works for the, for the Paiute Indian Tribe of Utah as a cultural resource. And we looked in to see how the word Paiute had come to be. I know in different, even the Hopis have a word for it that sounds similar to Paiute. So we're not really quite sure who actually gave the word Paiute to us. But yeah, we're, we're linguistically related to a lot of them. Um, we had crossed the Colorado River there to, to the Havasupai tribe, which I have relatives down there. Um, there was two twin ladies that got captured by the chief, chief manikaj of Havasupai. And one of them escaped and the other one he married and they had a lot of children together. So we have relatives down there. Uh, we're not, we can't understand each other. I know the, Hope, the, the Hopis and even the Comanches, uh, they have that Uto Aztecan language link all the way down to Aztec. So. Uh, in Mexico, so there, there's a lot of languages that do sound similar. Even the Northern Paiute have a lot of similarities, but I can't understand them. The Ute, the Ute tribe, the the Northern band that we have, the the Kusharam, there a lot of those were from the Ute tribe that were just a family of Utes that had moved down, and they were labeled as Paiute. But um, we speak the same language. They just talk quick, faster. Than, than us, but you can still understand them. So the northern Paiute actually are up in the Oregon mm -hmm. area, and that's somehow... Northern Nevada, too. Yeah, Nevada, northern Nevada and Oregon. I mm -hmm. went to a museum there and saw a bunch of things about the northern Paiute, but mm -hmm. um, they are linked just because of linguistically they are mm -hmm. very similar, but though, though you really don't have yeah. cousins up there yeah. or anything, really. No, they're more 
more Shoshone. Uh, there is a few words that I can understand, but our ceremonies are a little different other than this, the, the, round da the circle dance songs and the hand drum. Uh, we, that's the similarity that we have, but um, ceremonially wise, there's a lot of differences. So everybody, you can't just say I'm Paiute because you got to distinguish whether you're Northern or Southern. Mm -hmm. Okay, so tell us a little bit about the Paiute. I know that um, when the Spanish came through and the, the Spanish trail times, there was quite a bit of slavery, capture and slavery going on mm -hmm. uh, with taking young Indian children off to be slaves in California and that sort of mm -hmm. thing. What, what does your uh, history say about that? You know, other than oral history, because we didn't write a lot of things down other than the, the really old stuff that is written on the, the, the writings on the rocks, um, we haven't really written anything too, too much on it. I know my dad wrote some stuff on it in that Southern Paiute book, but um, I don't know too much about it. I know they weren't willingly sold or, or given. They were captured and taken and stolen. So I can't really, I, I don't really have a big history of, um, of that era or time. And my mom and my dad, they never talked to me about anything that concerned that other than that petroglyph site I was mentioning about the slave, the, the, the young lady that had found her way back from Mexico. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. So <coughs> when, when the uh, actual first European, not, not Spanish, but European people came down, like the Jacob Hamlin group, mm -hmm. how about, do you have any idea how large a population of people were here at that time? Or? They were saying they counted around 800 to 1,000 um, because we were farmers. Mm -hmm. We had a lot of the, the watermelons and the squash and all of that. You know, there was a guy from Beaver Dam that had found some seeds in a cave up at Shavuot somewhere. Mm -hmm. I don't remember where, but he planted them and it was a, a watermelon seed. So he called it the Shavuot's watermelon. And he gave us a he gave us a watermelon from that and said they'd found that in a cave somewhere. So we had, had were planters, um, farmers. Uh, I don't like using that word hunter gather because everybody hunted and gathered. <laughs> but seasonally we would, we would take off with the seasons, uh, go all the way north, go all the way south. And uh, certain times of years we celebrated the seasons. It was like a festival to us or a ceremony where we would welcome each season. So uh, we did a lot of traveling. And what kind of hunting are there legends about? Was it deer, elk? Um, what other, did they actually mm -hmm. have, um, you know, bighorn sheep? Mm -hmm. That was the main, yeah. Or no? Yeah, bighorn sheep was the main staple of food. We have legends, a lot of legends about the mountain sheep, how we were starving, uh, and the mountain sheep came forward and said that they would sacrifice their life so that we could live. And so in return, we honor the mountain sheep through song and dance. Mm -hmm. And also the mountain sheep is the most powerful. And they are the ones that you see on the petroglyph mm -hmm. to represent the people, which is us, the New World people. And so the mountain sheep is the most sacred animal in it because it sustained us through hardship and it gave the spirit of the mountain sheep gave the, the men the, the powers to heal. It brought rain. So we prayed a lot for help through the mountain sheep, but the mountain sheep wasn't our God or, or wasn't ever claimed to be anything more than um, one of our most um, sacred animals is the mountain sheep. But of course we used to have elk that came all the way down here uh, to the Shivitz Plateau till the seasons and the climate changes, but um, mostly deer, a lot of lizards. There was a Gila monster and there was a Chukwala, um, squirrels, all, everything from grasshoppers to bugs to, I know there was a grasshopper gruel they said they used to make, but I've never had it. <laughs> I always say I wanted to try it. You can order a lot of those insects that through the through the mall now, so I always tell my sons bring back some of those traditional foods that we used to eat, and of course living in the desert, people look out there and say, well, how can you survive? There's nothing out there, but every plant is useful. Mm -hmm. So.
so you can find water, moisture, everything in, in all of the plants, even the roots. And so there was, wherever you went, there was something to eat. Mm -hmm. So uh, tell us that little story about how your dad and his um, Shibwit friends went to the intertribal ceremonials and did the mountain sheep dance and started to get the Shibwits. You know, it was the most unknown tribe in mm -hmm. the, in the United States, but then after that, it became quite a bit more known. Yeah, and it was with my my relatives. I know there's the his name is Clarence John. He's still alive today. He actually does our singing for us mm -hmm. when we do the mountain sheep dance. Uh, he taught my boys and some of the youth in Shivwitz how to do the mountain sheep dance. Shivwitz was the only one that ever did that dance. But of course, when they would go to Flagstaff in the 60s and the 50s. Um, <clears throat> there was a lot of the Shivwitz dancers, but they also had some from Kasharam and Cedar Band, and so they had all done that mountain sheep dance. And so when they would go to Flagstaff, and I'm not sure what time, time of year it was, but they had all of the tribes come together, and they had a parade, and they would do all the different dances. And so Shivwitz had a, a, a postcard that said the least known tribe in America because we were so small. And so, well, actually it was the Southern Paiute, so... Um, they were known for that, but because they had won the mountain sheep dance contest every year for I don't know how many years, that's how they got known, that people started to know who the Southern Paiute were. And so when we um, were chair, well, when my sister was chairman and I was on council, we always say that we are at least one of the least known tribes in the United States. And so we thought of ways to bring awareness to it and to just get people out there. We do have a, a Shivwitz princess that goes to all of the celebrations that introduces herself from Shivwitz and from St. George. And I know one year, well, growing up here when I was younger and then coming back every year, everybody knew we were, we were Indians going into the store. Oh, are you from out from the reservation? And then it was probably in the 90s, all of a sudden, our, they would talk Mexican to you or Spanish and just say, oh, um, thinking that, that we weren't here. And then I got to thinking, do they even know there's a tribe that, that is from this? This is our, our land. Does anybody even know about us? And in the 2000s, when I had moved back, there was a, a letter that went out with the, the phone book that had asked for suggestions on how to make their phone book better. And I looked through that whole book and there wasn't one mention of our tribe. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know what, I, I think we are invisible. You know how many people I've, I've talked to and they said that, are you Mexican? And I said, no, I'm Indian. Oh, what tribe are you from? Where are you from? And I would say from here. Nobody knew we were here. So I just um, said that we're like the invisible people. So I wrote to the city and I said that you need to acknowledge that we exist still, that we're not gone. Yeah, we're, we're only, well back then we were just under 300. I says we're a small tribe but we're still here and we do exist. But um, we had a meeting back east with all of the city officials from Washington County and I told them that story. I said that we're the invisible people and that as leaders for your different departments that we should put our heads together and see how we can bring awareness to that we're, we're not gone, we're still here. But uh, without somebody really pushing it, and since I got off council, I, I don't know who's taken um, that responsibility, but I just think we, should, we need to, to bring awareness that we're, we aren't gone. Mm -hmm. And it's a struggle to be who we are, um, being under the government and it just seems like everybody sees us as people that are looking for handouts or, or that we can never achieve or strive to be anything better than just a dirty Indian. If you look at our history, everybody puts you down. And yeah, we did have, if you look at the internet, we aren't a beautiful people. We're living in the desert with barely any clothes. Our hairs were all cut. And you look at pictures from before 1800s, they had the long hair that was before death hit us. Mm -hmm. And once death came into our community, our hairs had to be cut. We have to cut our hairs. My, my relative just died a couple days ago and I got to cut my hair. And I cut it to the length that you'll see in the, in the, on the online of all the old photos that 
when you're in mourning, you cut your hair. And so if you look at the photos, everybody has short hair. If you look at those baptism pictures that they had here, they all had short hair. Every one of them had lost it. And you, you cut when you have an immediate family member die. And so you look at those pictures and they're sad. They're all just look like, yeah, poor, poor, dirty old Indians is what we were made to look like. And so it, it's hard to bring awareness to people now of who we really are because they look at those pictures and say, you're just a small little tribe that didn't go anywhere, or didn't achieve anything. But, but I try to bring that awareness to my kids and to all the youth that you be proud of who you are. You stand up for who you are. And we actually did, uh, um, all of the bands got together, Arizona, Nevada, <coughs> Utah, to do a curriculum for the Washington County School District, which was the, probably the sixth and seventh graders or seventh and eighth, I'm not quite sure. But we all gathered at one of the libraries and we talked about how to to put that curriculum together for the kids and the teachers there that were there to help us, we told them what needed to be added and they said, nope, you're not gonna add that. And we said, why? But you're hiding the truth. And they says, because if you add that, then all the parents are gonna get mad and say, what are you teaching my kid? That you're teaching them that we, um, the pioneers had murdered, killed um, the, the whole tribe he, they said, you can't do that. And I said, so you guys are telling a lie then? And they says, yes, to keep the parents happy. We can't, we can't disclose what really happened in history to your people. And I was, I was upset, but they were doing their job. It's not their fault. <laughs> so that curriculum is out on the Parashant National Monument website. If you click on teacher's link, you'll find it. And that's what I teach around to the libraries and the schools is that I take that culture gram and I, I've added to it and added photos to bring awareness of who we are, that we're not a poor, desolate tribe where we may be small, but we still have pride in who we are. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. I think the, the, the truth about the history, I think the, the climate today is a little mm -hmm. better than it was yeah. five, even five years ago. Yeah, it is. Of recognizing that sort mm -hmm. of thing. Um, Let's see, what else? Um, I've got a question, if you yeah. don't mind. Mm -hmm. um, I know a lot of my students tend to be interested in that time period where Native Americans were put on reservations, and a lot of the stories we have are from the white side. What was mm -hmm. it like for your people when they were first put on the reservations in the 1890s? In the 1890s, um, you know, they still hunted, they still snuck out, and they did a lot of the things that, that they could get away with, but uh, they had to make ends meet. I know they had gathered that yucca root and they would go into town and they would sell it for soap. And so they found, they found ways to make a little bit of money. But back then, they didn't need a lot of money as long as they had uh, the food. And my husband would tell stories that um, back in when he, he was a child that they fed, seems like they fed at least 10 families in one household. And it just seems like when you put, every, everybody puts the, as a community together, they, they seem to manage. And so, yeah, it was hardship, but they ate the, the, the rabbits and whatever means that they could. But they say it was hard. Um, it was hard because a lot of them hid out and didn't want to come to, to live on the reservation or even um, just didn't want to come to town to be known or seen because they tracked every single person and they, they, you know, they did the censuses and so they didn't want to be a part of that. So there was quite a bit that hit out. But um, I don't think, other than if you lived on the reservation, I don't think it was that hard other than a lot of hiding. I know they said that they hid a lot because they didn't want to be shot or, or accused of stealing something that they didn't steal. And so uh, it was just, it, it was a tougher time of how to be sneaky, I guess, and to survive without being seen. Okay. Um, did the Paiutes have the same <coughs> that a lot of the other tribes did with um, being sent off to boarding schools? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that was more in the, the 1900s. I'm not sure because I don't know. I know a lot of them went off to California and a lot went off to Kansas and Oregon, and so they did go all over. 
and they went to a lot of the Mormon placement homes and I know of a lot of my relatives that snuck away and didn't want to go back uh, and some of them that liked it but uh, they were a lot of them were shipped off and we had a project one time where we were going to go to all of the the boarding schools and do a ceremony because a lot of them had died and never come back and so we did lose a lot of the children through boarding schools. So how did the tribe fare during the Great Depression? And from there, um, you said they lost the recognition in the 50s. And what caused that loss of recognition? I'm not sure. And I, I didn't really, I, I did have something in the, it's written, I think, on that, the, in the Utah, in utahpaiutes.org. I might have a little more history on it, but I'm not sure who the president was at the time and or if it was Congress, so I couldn't give you details on that, but I know it's in the, it's online, you can find that. How did it affect the tribe when they lost recognition? They say it did, but you know, like you said, the depression where a lot of people depended on money back then, I don't think it was any harder than it was without the depression because we still knew how to live off the land. We still knew how to provide and get the food. And so that depression just meant you didn't have the money. But uh, other than for fuel and for gas, I guess, for if you had were cooking, cooked on by a campfire. So I don't think it hit the, the Paiutes as hard as it would uh, of the pioneers because it took them money to survive and it didn't take us the money, just, just the knowledge to survive and the skills to survive. And of course, you had to have water, which a lot of it was getting polluted, um, but it was still drinkable back then. So I don't think that was really an issue. But they just said financially, during the when they took away the recognition that the government stopped help with uh, the people that were sick, like the if they, diabetes wasn't as 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 um, known back then, but there was other diseases. And of course, cancer came through. My dad passed away from cancer. And they say that when they did the bombings, <clears throat> that fallout that came over this way. So a lot of them, there was, a, there was sickness, but it just, I think majority would be the sickness. And they were so used to the rations, getting the rations that when they stopped that um, it was just, you had to just go back to living off the land to find the resources they needed to survive. So when the Gunlock Road, the Santa Clara River that ran through your reservation, because mm -hmm. that dam is right there at the right at the end of mm -hmm. your reservation lands, did that have an effect on the water? I mean, the water was more controlled, I guess, after that because of flood issues. I'm sure that was mm -hmm. through the history some bad floods that came down through there. I've I've never heard anything about it being any different. Um, one thing I do want to note is that when that dam went up, they destroyed a lot of petroglyphs that went through that site and along that road, so they did destroy a lot. But uh, we did have water rights. The worked with Ivan's city and city of St. George to ha retain some water rights. And so it seems like we've always had the water. And of course, back then we had farms and along the, the reservation water line there. And then we had the, the fruit trees that are cut down now, but we did have means to survive and plant things. So. Water wasn't really an issue. I know we have an economic development fund right now that is because of the water rights. Um, when they put up the right of way on the reservation, they had put it, uh, everything has to be pre, pre agreed on, and they had put a road in that was just off of that, that, that right of way. And so the tribe sued for, to get that that corrected and so because of that we got a big settlement for that and so the money was put aside for economic development so anything to do with water right now we can use uh, that money to to develop anything that is economic development so so we're good financially when it comes to economic development but it's just which companies or who do you want to bring onto the reservation that's going to that's going to benefit our tribe. I know there's some things that we still have to follow under the Utah state laws. I know we had a lot of um, issues with tobacco, selling tobacco on our reservation because we have a convenience store. And so we still have to follow some Utah laws, but 
we can break away and do our own because they say we're sovereign, but yet we still have to get permission to, 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 to do things. But we try to stay as sovereign as we can without falling under Utah state laws so that we can have more rights. I know this um, medical marijuana issue that's coming up, we can legally plant and do that on our reservation, but is the state going to fight us so hard that we're just not going to want to do it? So it's going to benefit our tribe, but it's not going to benefit them. So I think we'll have a big battle ahead of us, but I know financially it's really going to help our tribe, so we'll see. And I always say I'm not afraid to fight. And I've always told our lawyer that. I said we got a lot of people that from our res that just want to sit back and they don't want to go to court over anything. They're just so used to just being behind behind the closed door that they don't want to stand up and fight. And I don't blame them because it's a it's a battle and you have to have a strong voice to want to stand up and fight. And so economic development wise we're we're in a good spot where we can we can develop a lot of stuff. We just have to have good leaders in there to, to want to do it. So the people, the, the people that, mm -hmm. what is their main, what do they do for income? Do they do the crafts? Do they have paying jobs in the in town? Mm -hmm. what, what's the general? Mostly jobs in town. Uh, we do have a convenience store that opened a few years back that it's all native employment, but we also hire out. So it's not, uh, it's native preference and it's tribal preference uh, for our band mostly, but if they don't qualify, then it goes to the next in line. So uh, it is managed by our own tribal people, and so that's good. But for a while there, the Moapa Band of Paiutes, they made it uh, when they opened up their solar sites and they had a lot of jobs come that they put it in their, their compact that they had uh, Indian preference was first, especially Paiutes. So a lot of our tribal members were driving every day to, to Moapa, which is an hour away. And the pay was so good, you couldn't get a job here for that pay. And they were like $25 an hour. So they were purposely hiring Paiutes to help better the, their communities. So, and since that job ended, a lot of them just in town. And other than the store there, it's just uh, not too many make a living off of um, crafts. Mm -hmm. I know pottery, nobody's done pottery. I know we, with the youth, we wanted to bring that back and do some pottery basket making, um, cradle board making. There is a few that does sell for a living. And our store makes it so that it's, uh, if you have any beaded items or anything, you can go to the store and sell it to them. And so there is an income for those that don't want to work. And that's how, uh, if I could, that, that's um, how I lived a long time ago was to sell beadwork and to make a living. But I could still do that today if I took the time out to make the, the crafts to do it. But I haven't done that lately, but uh, my dad always taught us that um, you learn all the crafts that you, the skills that you can, because it'll help you survive one day without having to go out and get a job. Yeah. And I believe that, and I've taught my kids that, that you can become your own, you can be self-employed and be your own boss. Mm -hmm. So the future for your tribe is going to be more economic development, mm -hmm. possibly, you know, Maybe uh, did, I heard one time that you were considering doing a solar project out there. Did you ever? They did. They checked on the wind because we get a lot of wind out there. They, you know, the windmills. <clears throat> they tried that, but it, they said it wasn't enough wind to generate enough electricity. So mm -hmm. that fell through. Um, we did some concerts for a while out there to do events out there, but got a lot of slack on that because people were drinking and you know they always they. We're known, the tribal people are known as, uh, oh, all we are is drunken Indians. And so they seen the events and said, oh, yeah, they're going to support that because they're drunken Indians. But that didn't go too well, so we quit that after a while. So right now we're looking at uh, farming. Um, anything to do with water, like growing, or uh, we, we do have a portion of the reservoir at Ivan's there. And we have the selling rights, like if we want to put up a food booth or anything. So uh, we had an economic committee that I was on, but that um, they closed that up since we got the, the new committee and our new council in. So I'm not on that committee, so I have no idea, but we were going to do a concession booth out at the reservoir. Mm -hmm. So I know that down the line that's going to be in the works and uh, maybe an RV park. Um, 
expand the store, the gas station. I know we added some more fuel pumps. So, so we're, the store makes a lot of money, that convenience store. Yeah. So we have a good income, uh, good enough that every year they give tribal members a bonus off of that. So it does go back into economic and to support the store, but they, they give out when they can. Mm -hmm. So we're growing. It's slow, but we're growing. So when do you have there on, on your part of the reservation? I mean, where you, do you host a powwow out there, or do you mm -hmm. go elsewhere for the powwows? Powwows isn't uh, a Paiute tradition. Okay. Because they dance, borrowed dances from other tribes. Mm -hmm. So, um, Powwows is off. We, we've had held a couple through the years, mm -hmm. but we go off to other reservations that hold them. And you can dance for competition in each of the categories, or you could just go to dance for fun. So when I tell the youth, because they always say, oh, powwows is my tradition, and I say, no, it's not. You have to know what your traditions really are and what your dances are. For the first year's, year that I was on um, tribal council, which is the four years. I did four years of our traditional dance, which is the round dance or the circle dance. So for every spring, we would hold a round dance for the four years. And we invited a lot of the elders out to come and sing songs that nobody had heard or songs just, just to hear the variety of songs. And so after the four years, I didn't do that. I haven't done that since, but everybody said they really enjoyed it because a lot of the elders that were singing back then aren't alive today, so a lot of it was recorded. So we have recordings of a lot of the elders that did sing. But <clears throat> other than the Paiute Restoration Gathering that's held in June annually, that, that's the only power that, that we have. I know the Las Vegas tribe holds one in the spring also. And spring is a time of celebration because everything comes in bloom and new growth, new life. So. That's when they usually have their celebrations, is to welcome in the, the, the summer or the spring. Very interesting. Any other questions from anybody? Um, I do. So it sounds like, as a tribe, you've experienced some heritage loss. Like you mentioned in our last interview, that you can understand the language, but you can't necessarily speak it. Um, and that you're very concerned about making sure your son knows some of his tradition and history. Do you feel like that's kind of been a general trend over time? Just like having to fight for it and mm -hmm. what has influenced that? Because there's not a lot of full-blooded now, um, there's a lot of intermarriage. And so if you're getting a child that is half Mexican and half Indian, um, the, the mother, say she's Paiute, don't know a lot of the, the, the traditions, and the father, which is Mexican, does. He's going to want to teach his child to more of his heritage. And so a lot of that mixed blood came into play when um, it was just a conflict of what parent is going to teach what. And if that wasn't a conflict, uh, a lot of them didn't have the, because of diabetes and a lot of the diseases that our people didn't live past their 50s and so it's rare to have elders that live in their 70s and 80s now back then back in the early 1900s there's a lot of elders and so there's just not a lot of teaching uh, along with the language other than two elders talking to each other it just wasn't popular to just go out and speak and of course back then you got a lot of slack if you said it wrong and got teased a lot, so a lot of kids just didn't want to talk their language because they didn't want to get teased or made fun of for saying the word wrong. So a lot of the, the dances died out, and they were just celebrations in the spring and summer, like I said, but they would just go out and, and celebrate and dance, and a lot of those just, just stopped. I know in the 50s, my dad had recorded. He has on recording on Reel to Reel a lot of the, just out of the blue, they'd just hold a celebration and all of the tribes, people would come in and dance and sing. And so um, I think back then it was just more of a, just to get away, just to enjoy. And now the only time we get together is for a funeral, it seems like. We don't do a lot of that, that the celebrating like we used to. So I know the book my dad wrote, The Southern Paiute, he had written down everything that he knew and he had it in pencil just a, it was a pretty thick book just all written handwritten notes and he never uh, intended to write that book 
And my sister and I, back in the early 90s, when they had the huge Macintosh computers <laughs> before the laptops, um, he was doing a project. And we told him, well, why don't we just type all that up into a book form? I says, I wouldn't mind reading it one day, because I couldn't read his notes. And so he says, if you got, girls want to do it, go ahead. So every day, my sister and I took turns, and we just typed what we could, and because he was right there, he would tell us what the the word was if we couldn't read it, and so we got that book together, and because of that book in book form, it was just for us, like it was for me. I say that book was meant for me because um, I wanted it in book form, and so we had it to just look at every, whenever we wanted. If we wanted to learn something and my dad wasn't available to tell us, we would just pull out that book, which of course was just printed out on just thrown together in a little folder. And so the publisher seen it and said he'd publish it just as a favor. And so it was published and we gave it out to a lot of our friends and relatives and they say that if it wasn't for my dad and all of that he had preserved and shared with everybody that it would have been lost. And so um, he does mention in there that there's some things he couldn't add because he didn't want, I guess it was meant for Paiute eyes only. And so I actually have his originals and I was gonna go and compare and look through that and see what they were and then just share it with my people if it was something of interest. So that's on my to-do list is just to go see what was left out that we could share. So now I tell everybody from our tribe or whoever wants to listen that you have to write it down. If it's not written, nobody's gonna believe you. We're so used to oral history and that we tell our stories, um, legends in the winter and history throughout throughout the year that uh, it's gonna change from one person to another. And it's not gonna be the same, so that they need to write it down. Otherwise, nobody's ever gonna believe it ever happened. And of course, if you get a book in the library, they're gonna believe that over what you say and you know or you've lived and so you have to write it down, otherwise our, our history is going to be uh, different. I know one time the Paiute Indian Tribe of Utah had a, a whole segment on who we were as, as a people, and I went and looked through that, and I thought, who wrote this? Because they were talking about things that we didn't do. They said there was a stick sticking out of a basket in the back that the lady would lean on and I go, I've never ever seen that, who wrote this? And so I guess it was one of the workers, employees had copied it off of a book and kind of changed it around. I said, so, so see what you're getting off of the books isn't true. A lot of that, it was just, they, they were putting down the man in there and I thought, that's just, that's not us. Our own people need to write our history because then it's the truth. So I, I stress that, that you need to write it down. <clears throat> don't or record it or film it don't just uh, oral history it because it's not going to be the same very good and so Levan, he was the first one to write down a history of the local Paiutes here. there was a lot of other books written and it was William Palmer that did a, the majority of them and my dad knew William Palmer and he said he glamorized it he glamorized all the legends. He made it look so that people would want to read it. So he fairy tailed a lot of it. And so, because my dad would read through it and say, well, that's not how it really happens. And William said, well, I had to glamorize it to sell. So there was other books written. And a lot of the photos you see that were staged, he dressed them up. I don't know where he got it. He, he called them costumes and he'd throw it on a Paiute and say it was Paiute, but it wasn't. So. Um, he was probably the one that did the majority of the history of the Paiutes, but I've, I have a collection of them. There's probably 10 or more books out there on Paiute. Um, a lot of it's not accurate, some of it is. Uh, I don't know on a lot of it, but it's this one, he, he broke it up into the legends, the lore, the, the lineage, and the language. He has a lot on the language, but he only put just some of the words in there that people would want to know, not the whole dictionary. So he just um, had to put it into a book that people wouldn't get bored with or want to read. So, But there's there's been a few books. And now there's a lot of, um, what do they call those, uh, when the archaeologists, they, they gather all the information and they put them into volumes and 
Yeah, so there's a lot of those out there, and I have a collection of those too that's interesting because they actually hire tribal members to go out and talk, and so they get the history from them. So those are really good, and it's not for public view, but it does have a lot of history. So do you, do you know when the first outsiders came in? Do, they have, do you have a, a history of that? We don't. I've never read anything on that. Um, my dad wrote everything he could on that history, and I've never seen anything that said that the first first time they've ever seen seen a stranger walk into the land have no no history of that. That'd be interesting to know, though, if it was written down. It could be written on a rock somewhere. Yeah, it could. <laughs> Because I don't think we even know where Santa Clara got its name. And the, your people were here mm -hmm. when it was when it got its name. Yeah, I don't know I where that. that the the the, the uh, Dominguez and Escalante and the early Span Spaniards that came on the Spanish trail named it Santa Clara. That's what I've read in the history somewhere. So it's mm -hmm. pre, um, you know, any kind of. LDS missionaries or anything, it was right. pre that, that it was named that. And a lot of our tribal, or um, the Indian names that went to each of the landscapes is all gone. I know my dad in that book had written a lot of them that says place unknown, but the, the name's there, but the place is unknown. And so I've looked, looked for a lot of them, like that big um, mountain just, be, just above Ivan's there. The big, big one. They have a Paiute name for that, and it has to do with protruding because it looks like a pregnant woman. Mm -hmm. So it's got an Indian name, and so I, I'm curious too. A lot of times, especially when I was cultural resource manager, on trying to name things, and I wanted to do my own map, map with just Paiute names in it. But when you're on <coughs> council, you have so much other duties. It's hard to sit back and do one specific thing. <clears throat> I'm sure the Paiutes had a name for the river, mm -hmm. Santa Clara River. I'm sure they had a particular name for that and mm -hmm. many other things. Yeah. The one thing that we didn't like was they would slap the Navajo name on a lot of things. <laughs> Navajo Lake, <laughs> Navajo Trail, <laughs> yeah. because there were people that weren't originally from this land and so for them to be naming them for everything, and we tried to change names once in a while, but it's hard. They say, oh, no, we can't change it. It's been there too long, or it means more to have that name. So, um, yeah, there's there's a lot of names we try. I think there's a few sites we got to change mm -hmm. and, um, and, and add here. On the Santa Clara River <laughs> mm -hmm. Reserve, yeah. uh, trails, bike trails, mm -hmm. and hiking trails, they all have a Paiute yeah. name. Yeah. So that is that was a step forward. That was, and there's actually uh, a project. There's a new dam going up at, by Tokerville that they had specifically asked the Paiute Indian Tribe of Utah to help. And because the Shivwits lived in Washington County, they asked us to, to lead the way in finding a name. So, because Tokerville means, uh, it is the name of a, a chief that means black. Mm -hmm. It's Tukwar that that in Paiute, that's how you say it. We wanted to make sure that Tokerville meant our chief. So we said Chief Tokerville so that people will put two and two together and say, oh, Tokerville is the name of a Paiute. But um, there was a little inner fighting within our, our bands that the Kaibab didn't like the word chief. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times uh, they're called, like my husband gets called chief all the time. Well, right now he is the chief, he's the chairman of the band, but mm -hmm. they just say, hey, chief. And so it got to be like a derogatory term to a lot of people because you were just known as chief, hey, chief, because you were a man. And so Kaibab didn't like that. We, they, we were calling the place Chief Toker mm -hmm. Reservoir. And then so the Paiute tribe stepped in and they, they removed that name. And so our band was upset because we, we had a survey on it. We asked everybody, do you think we should call it Chief Toker to let people know that we had a, a leader over there that <clears throat> was friends with the pioneers and he was well known and we knew where he was buried and just to let people know, but it got removed so the place is just Toker Dam or something like that. So we have a, a little bit of inner fighting once in a while when it comes to names, but um, we, we, we thought about naming it a complete Paiute name, but 
you know, they get butchered and you can't pronounce it and <laughs> you can't, it, it changes. So we just thought, well, just stick with toker. Anything, anything in closing you'd like to say about your your people? I don't think so. I think I said it all. I know, like I said, we're a small tribe that they don't like to be recognized. Like they just want to be the who they are without that recognition. But I think I, I'm proud of our tribe. I'm proud of what we've accomplished, how we've survived, the things that we do, the skills that we have, and so I'm just. I want everybody to, to know who we are. So I'm not ashamed and I teach my kids that. I know there was, there's statistically a lot of suicides in Indian country <clears throat> because they're not proud of who they are. The kids, uh, they get bullied or the color of their skin. And so I just like to instill pride in who they are and that we do have a history and that we're still surviving. That no matter what has been thrown at us, we've managed to pull through. So I'm just proud of who we are. and. I'm not ashamed to say that we're a Paiute Indian tribe of Utah. We're still here. Great, that's great to end on. Okay, before we close, if possible, would you mind um, spelling out how both you say the people, the spelling that phonetically, mm -hmm. as well as the native way of saying the Because mm -hmm. our transcribers will thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I need to uh, have a pen so I can spell it out. Um, in Utah, we use Nungwu. Uh, I'm not sure if there's a no. Um, CV Sing. I think that's how it is. And that's the people. <clears throat> and whitish earth people. Or you could just say white earth people. Okay. <clears throat> okay, very good. Now, uh, would you like to do just a very short, um, maybe 15 minutes, of just your own? personal history would <clears throat> and, and then one day I just says oh, I wouldn't mind playing so I started messing around with it and the song my dad taught me that he'd learned um, I played it and he goes you outdid me he goes I'm never picking that up again he goes <laughs> you outdid me on that song <laughs> so he learned he had composed one other song and so he says can you can you learn this song and, and play it so I did so but my dad he was our speaker for, for like all my sisters and I, and so he always did our talking. So he'd always say, Shanna, go get the flute, go play the flute. So I got so tired of playing the flute, I didn't want to do it no more. And so my sister learned Jetta. And so her and I would do duets once in a while. We'd play here and there, but uh, I just got tired of playing it. <laughs> it was just, I, I, it, it was more for performance instead of just because I wanted to. So I just, I put it away for years. It wasn't until I got this one that I started playing it. And then my sister had married um, a guy from Oklahoma that had his own uh, recording studio, Millard Clark. He had Indian sounds. And he says, I want to record you and put you on a CD. So mm -hmm. I did, but I wasn't real happy about it. I did it just oh, because. <laughs> Do I you? <laughs> of course, uh, I'm never happy yeah. with my voice or my mm -hmm. songs or anything. So mm -hmm. I, it was for the people. So. As long as I don't have to listen to it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, shall we start? Um, you're going. Uh, now, uh, again, on November 16th at VSU in the, uh, up in the archive area, and we are talking with uh, Shenandoah Martino Anderson today about her life um, as a Native uh, person living here in St. George, Utah, and she is going to tell us a little bit about her life and her um, works throughout her life with her tribe, and also demonstrate some of her uh, talents. Well, I was raised with 
four other sisters that I had. Um, my oldest, she was the half-sister. I had two full-blooded sisters. Then we adopted a little girl. She was Apache. And then on my mom's side, she remarried, and she had two daughters and a son. So I had a lot of sisters and one brother <clears throat> growing up. So we moved to San Carlos, Arizona, when I was probably five, five or six, and went to school there. We lived in Globe, Arizona for a while, and then down to San Carlos, and then to Safford, and then so we kind of moved around in, in Arizona, but I grew up down there amongst the Apaches, but my dad said that you will always be Paiute, so he made sure that we came back as often as we could to Utah, so we, we would come and visit our mom, our aunts, our grandma, everybody, and then of course he took us to a lot of the celebrations in Colorado, Toyak, um, we had some relatives over there, Fort Duchesne, <clears throat> so we grew up dancing. My my mom, when her and my dad were together, she had done a lot of beading and outfits, and so we had this little buckskin dress that we all had as a hand-me-down, and it was really nice, and so we all learned to dance at a young age, and our dad, well, he loved to travel, so we'd go around every summer to powwows, and it was to Canada, all the way back east, uh, Washington. We had a little powwow circuit, we called it, that we'd go around and just dance at. So we grew up on the powwow trail, um, grew up in a teepee because we would put the teepee up there every weekend. And wherever we traveled, we were known as the family with all the animals because we'd pick up an animal here or there. We found a little baby skunk that we took with us to powwows. We got a little hawk one year that we took to it with us to powwows. Um, we'd have uh, snakes. We would keep it for about a week and let it go. But we had um, we had a porcupine one year, coyote, a fox. So we've had a variety of animal, animals that we always traveled with. And so we would just powwow all summer. It was just, I remember, they were just so fun just going around. And we met a lot of people that became family. And so we, we just lived the powwow. I call it the powwow trail, powwow life. And of course, my dad wanted us to grow up Indian. He was half white, but he, he made us. And, and it, that seems like a harsh word, but it was more, it was our life that we would go sit with the elders. And I remember sitting at the feet of a lot of them and they would tell us stories. I don't care if it was uh, about their legends, about us as women, our do's and don'ts, what we could do, what we couldn't do, um, taught us how to bead. We learned a lot of their secrets when it came to tanning hides. Um, doing quill work, even dyeing quills. So we grew up learning a lot of the traditions and our dad made sure that we we could learn everything we could. He said that it would help us throughout our life to if we ever needed to sell arts and craft to make some quick bucks or quick money because he did that. He made arrowheads every weekend. It seemed like he was always sitting there making arrowheads to sell. And he would sell them for a couple of dollars, but it was enough gas to get us to the next place. And then when we got older, we would sell stuff. And to this day, we sell items. <clears throat> that uh, beadwork goes for a lot of money nowadays, so you can make a lot of money. So we grew up just traveling, spend the winters at, in Arizona. And um, because he recorded a lot of the petroglyph sites, we would take off uh, every weekend and go somewhere and record, walk miles and miles and miles, especially in the summer. I remember being in the summer heat, just traveling and recording sites. So we grew up on the ground, grew up um, sleeping on the ground, grew up in a teepee. Even in the winter, we'd put our teepee up next to where we, wherever we stayed, and we would just live inside the teepee. It was, it was nice. Uh, we had a close-knit family, all my sisters and I. <clears throat> and through the years, um, they, we, would, we would leave, but we'd always seem to come back. It just seemed like we wanted that family togetherness. So. We never permanently just moved away and never came back like a lot of people do, where they move all the way across town, town or across the world somewhere and you don't see them very often, but we were always close growing up. So we would teach at schools when we were old enough. Um, the Wallapai tribe invited us since the early 80s to teach anything from my flute here to 
dancing to showing arts and crafts to tanning hides, everything. Anything we would, they, we'd say, well, let us know what you want. We'll write it down and we'll come for a week and teach the kids. So we would teach at different schools. We taught in Havasupai. We taught um, a lot of this, the schools and the camps that they had in Canada. So uh, that was our skill was just arts and craft. I never really had a real job my whole life. It was either dancing because you can make a thousand dollars a week if you are good enough at dancing. Um, to selling selling something for a thousand dollars so it just depended on we never did have to have a job so our life was just traveling <clears throat> and I missed that um, I got married and of course when you're married you can't <laughs> go off as often as you can <laughs> so uh, I miss traveling but that's what we grew up doing I when I moved back to um, Utah it wasn't until the year 2000, my dad got sick and then he eventually passed away, so we buried him up here. And so I just stayed here. <clears throat> and then I got on tribal council for eight years and I got off in 2017. So just been over, it's going to be two years coming up that I've been off tribal council. And so I want to get back into traveling and doing a few things. Now that I'm off tribal council, um, a lot of my dad's work that he had done and recorded and he did a lot of maps and and he has a lot of notes and pencil that I'm starting to, I want to put into book form. So I talked with my sisters and we got the Martino archives up and running to where we can start uh, publishing his books and put on digital format a lot of the stuff that, that he has and even do videography or just do some short films of things and so. Um, Whenever, well, they haven't, they, they have, they all have jobs. We kind of all live in the same area. So we're within distance of each other to visit or to do projects. But that's my new project is to just work on the Martino archives that my dad left behind and um, that the work with the petroglyphs and um, to start traveling. I actually just got a letter this morning that said that my first article I did was just published worldwide and so she says you're published now she said so just to keep it up so I'm kind of excited I haven't read it yet but well I've read it because I wrote it but I haven't actually seen it on paper so <clears throat> it was done in Italy so she says you're you'll be well world known instead of locally known which is fine with me because it seems like you have more issues and fight with the locals than you do with other people <laughs> because they've lived here and take claim to this land and say well you don't know that or so so I'm just venturing off trying a variety of things and see where it goes I'm getting back into dancing I started um, uh, being a little healthier because I am older now and so trying to eat better and lose the weight and get back into dancing get my kids back into dancing they were little and they danced and I made them some nice outfits that they outgrew it and so they don't have any so I'll eventually just make them some outfits and we'll go off to go dancing and um, stress to them, uh, show them a lot of the sites that we've been to. I've never taken them to San Carlos where I grew up and so I told them maybe by summer we'll go hit the road and go see where I grew up and the things that I did because my two boys, they're teenagers now. They. They think they know everything, so <laughs> I have to show them some of the stuff that I know, and hopefully they'll retain it and want to do take my path. I, I always stress to them that, well, this is what I wanted to do when I was younger, but I never got to do it, so maybe you'll want to do that. And they I just say, nope, no, Mom, I got my own things I want to do. <laughs> but they're, I try to teach them as traditionally as I can, but... In this modern world now where everybody looks down at their phone or they have a game, it's kind of hard to, to instill in them how I was raised because we didn't have that. We didn't have the TV. We didn't have, we had a little black and white TV, but so back then it was so much easier to learn and to, there was a lot of elders. Now we have maybe a couple that I can take them to and that's it. And so they still know the language, but my kids are so into their little modern things that they want to do that it's hard to say well, let's go sit down and talk to somebody so times have changed <clears throat> and I heard somebody say not too long ago at a meeting that we're 
we're a dying race and that if we don't keep our blood and we don't continue to teach our kids that we're going to melt into invisibility. Well, I feel that now, but it's just a struggle. It's, it's hard to stay in modern society and still be traditional. A uh, flute song. Yes, we'd love In order to play flute that I had to learn the hard way, so I had to learn how to make a traditional flute, which is one piece. This is two pieces glued together. And so he said I, we had to go pick a, a branch, and then we had to learn how to hollow it out without modern tools. And it took a long time, but I did it, <laughs> and I made it. I have a lot of pride in my little flute I made. It doesn't play very well, but... <clears throat> what, what kind of wood is that? This is Purple Heart. It's from South America. And it's got this purplish, really deep red, red tone to it. But I don't know, I think he ordered it online somewhere. It was my cousin that did it. And this is where the, you have to get this just right or the, the air when you blow in has to come up over and back down. So if you don't have this just right, the air will blow everywhere. And it's gotta be super tight. And he's got a little road runner on here. <clears throat> so you hollowed that out? This one I didn't, this oh. one uh, my cousin made for me. And so, I've taught flute playing, and I've showed the kids to just learn, just get your hands used to these. I was self-taught. I have never, uh, I don't know how to read music or never did any type of um, instruments growing up. But my dad, when he had first learned, he learned an old Paiute song, and, and this is how he taught me, and this is how he played it. Oh, let me find the, the right song. He taught me that one, <clears throat> and he says, well, let me see how you play it. So I, I took off from him. I didn't want him to see me play it, so I came back, and I learned it. And he goes, well, you outplayed me. I'm never playing again. So I just learned to, well, because I was self-taught, I just played it from my heart. <clears throat> And that was the same song, I just added feeling to it, is what I always say. Then he taught me another one that I really like, and he composed it. And so I play this, this song quite a bit that he composed. And I've com composed a few of my own. I am. Um, I just enjoyed it for a while there. I just would just sit there and just learn songs. And then I learned that I used to get a lot of the songs in my dreams. And when I would wake up, I wouldn't do anything about it. I'd say, oh, I'll remember it when I wake up. And I wouldn't. And so that ability left me. And I talked to some people about it. And they said that 
you're given a lot of opportunities in life from your ancestors that give you things and if you don't take it, take it when they give it to you it'll go away so that ability to learn songs was given to me but I didn't use it so it went away so I did <laughs> learn one song on the flute that I, I did wake up and I wrote it down I mean not wrote it but I I just hummed it into my my recorder and I learned it so I do have one of those dream songs but I used to be given a lot of dream songs but I to this day I just regret <laughs> not ever recording them because I've heard of a lot of people that say that that the songs were given to them and they <clears throat> they may be famous today because they they continued what they did but I've never looked or sought after fame or to be recognized. I just enjoyed doing what I was doing, so I would just do it and never wanted to make money off of what I've done, my crafts. I just just do it to pass it on and because I learned it and why not share it? <clears throat> and they say that if you learn something, it's your you have the responsibility of sharing and passing it on. So that's what what I've I've told all of my relatives and friends and family that my door is always open. Anything you want to learn, I'm here. So around deer season time, they'll bring, bring me their deer hides and I'll say, well, I'm not tanning it for you. You got to come here and I'll show you how to do it. So I get some offers where they want to come and learn. So I just, any, whatever they want to learn, I'm willing to share. <coughs> well, thank you so much mm -hmm. for all your knowledge, first of all, and all of your um, willingness to share mm -hmm. with uh, those that need to learn these things. What music forms did they have? Uh, the Paiutes did. Was it just vocal song, or did they have instruments? They had the drum, but that went with music, which was circle dance songs. They had quail dance songs. They had. Um, the mountain sheep songs, but they were just songs that talked about the land. They talked because they were so grateful for all that was given to them that they were giving respect and honor back to what was given to them for survival. So it was just mostly songs about um, as offering or just good songs to just, just to sing. So they were all just self-composed. Some were prayer songs. Um, they would play flute and it wasn't nothing ceremonial other than the rattle, which is the gourd. They would uh, that was for ceremony, um, but the the hand drum was for singing and social, and so it was just hand drum and flute, as far as I know. I know they had the violin with a lot of the tribes. I know in Mexico they have a lot of the people that had played violin and so certain types of stringed instruments. But for us, it was mostly the gourd. And they did have uh, the hand game, which is they would hit a stick on a log. And just the sound of that, the stick on the log, made that sound where they would sing hand game songs. So it was just mostly vocal. <coughs> okay. Thank you so much yeah. for your time and coming in and sharing all this information mm -hmm. with us. did pretty good today. Um, as far as like getting the word out, mm -hmm. um, do you, like, what do we want to do with this? Do you? Um, what, what's kay. your suggestion? So, I know that um, the Washington County Historical, who has funded the project, would like to have a copy. The archives. Right. Of course, so, a copy. And the Santa Clara Historical Museum would like to have a copy. Those three copies. And Shannon would like to have a copy, too. Absolutely. So what I'm going to have you do is I'm going to give you a release form. And if you're comfortable signing it today, that would be preferable. What it will do is it will transfer um, the copyright of the intellectual material to DSU and the library. The reason we ask that you share it with us is that it allows us in the future to actually use that recording. Mm -hmm. um, and to allow others to use it. Um, it's not that we're trying to control your work in any, any way. You will retain a um, basically non-exclusive license for the rest of your life. You can use it however you want. It just means that in the future, they don't have to go to your sons and say, hey, I want to use the recording of your flute playing. So that's the only reason we have it. Mm -hmm. that we then can give that permission. <coughs> um, you'll have the option of 
restricting the oral history for a number of years. You can restrict whether or not you want it to go online or if you want your name to be publicly known. But I'm going to say that one's going to be a little hard <laughs> considering you're talking about your dad. <laughs> um, and so it's just going to transfer that rights to us. Um, what we'll do is we'll take the recording, we'll transcribe it on the two different days, and then we will send it to both Susie and to yourself so that you can have the chance to review it. And if we totally butcher a name or spelling, you have the chance to correct it. Or mm -hmm. if you're like, wait, I misremembered that during, you can correct it at that point. Um, and those corrections will, granted, only show on the transcript, mm -hmm. but 99% of people only look at the transcript. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you do have that chance um, to review it as well before it goes public. Once it's done, we'll send a printed copy to both yourself, unless you'd prefer a digital, we can do both as well. Um, we'll send one to the Santa Clara, and I don't know that the county particularly, the Historical Society particularly wants a physical copy of it. No, not a physical, but, but they would like a digital. Yeah. Um, <coughs> so long as you give the rights to put it online, I'm certain the County Historical Society will put it online on their website. Um, and that would be both, if you want to note a restriction on, like you're okay with the transcript going up and not the video, kind of that's where you want to say whether or not it's allowed online, mm -hmm. okay? Like what do you think <coughs> as far as getting the word out about the Paiute uh, group and keeping your history alive and that pretty much has to be done on their side, the Paiute tribe's side. Mm -hmm. Because now, whenever I go anywhere, I have to say I'm speaking on behalf of myself. Mm -hmm. I have to always put a claim in there because mm -hmm. now, you, depending on who you got on council, they're going to say, well, why are you talking on our behalf? Did we send you over there? Or we didn't give you permission to speak about us. And so it's so hard. So it pretty much has to be done with them. So I speak on behalf of myself. So did they do social media? <laughs> we had, when my sister and I were in there, she, she's good at the website. So she had a website up talking about our band, Shubwitz Band. So we had all the history, everything on there. But once she got off, they, they closed that up. So right what? now it's the utahpaiutes.org is the only one. How do you want to get the word out with what you're doing? I'm going to start internationally <laughs> because uh, I have a lot of friends and professors in, in Italy and um, a lot of people in Australia. So if you start out and work your way in, I think that <laughs> might be the best way. So you don't have any <laughs> desire to start an Instagram channel for... Yeah, and I, I opened some up, but I haven't touched them yet. Like I, I have them under Shenandoah. But I just, and I, I do have a website up on my dad, levanmartino.com, but <coughs> talking about all of his archives and all of his stuff. But I just kind of got so busy digitizing everything and typing up stuff because um, it was through uh, like a job. Like I was paid, I had so many months to get it done till July, and so it was a job. And so I sat there and just typed and typed till my eyes hurt. And now that job's done, I'm, we're still doing it, but we're looking for other funding to continue it, or looking for interns that can help to type up stuff so we can get it out quicker, because we want to publish a book. And I'm talking about Carol Patterson, she's the one helping me. She, um, she has done a lot of books. My dad knew her, helped her write a lot of books on petroglyph writing. Hmm. But she, I think she's a professor. I know she taught at a lot of the schools Where in she Colorado. At? She's from out of Colorado. Hmm. I'm not sure if she's, Colorado Springs, is there a college over there? Yeah. And I think that's where she was, she was out of. So her and I, She's the one that was funding me to get the book out. She said she didn't want anything in payment. She just wanted the book to be published because she said there's a lot of people like you that could learn yeah. just every day going out and having a little dictionary yeah. saying, oh, well, I think I can read that. So it was pretty much she wants it out So because she said all that stuff my dad wrote is just going to waste. And her goal is just to get it published. <clears throat> and so she's the one that's pushing me to to publish it 
but I have all the say. And my sisters, I ask them permission too, but it's pretty much my say. So I'm going to actually have both you and Susie um, sign this form. Mm -hmm. Go ahead and read it. If you have any questions, please let me know. So I can't put any of this on the Washington Fan historical social media or their YouTube channel or anything like that. Well, if she signs, if she signs that we can, <laughs> then we can. That, that's, that's the distinction. <laughs> yeah. And I'm not one to be filmed. Like I've been on uh, a lot of films, but I just don't, I don't like to see or hear myself, <laughs> but you can't get around it. No, so. you can't get around it, and you've done an excellent job, I must say. <laughs> it's been fascinating. All of us were just like, here, <laughs> we really learned some stuff today. So I don't like to be seen, but I, I, I do it for my kids is what I say. This, uh, you know, <laughs> this uh, history of your dad, mm -hmm. where did you get that? Where did you get that? He wrote it. Um, she has one copy. He started it copy back copy. in yeah, back in the early nineties. Yeah. He said, I need to write this down because there's so many things in, in, in my life that happened that I'm gonna forget if I don't write it down. So he wrote that pretty much his whole life. And then I completed it when he passed away, but um, it took a lot of years, but I have the only copy. Would you like to have this copy? here in the archives? Video. Not right now because I'm not sure what we want to do with it yet. My sisters don't, don't they don't really want it out there. <laughs> well, if you put it here, it wouldn't be published or anything. It would just be sitting, wouldn't it just be sitting so here? So with something like that, um, we would keep it in the same format and we would put it in the catalog as a book, mm -hmm. an autobiography, which means if somebody came in the door and asked to see it, we would share it with them. Mm -hmm in building, but we wouldn't have permissions to give them, like we're asking for with mm -hmm. this, we wouldn't have permissions to give them use of it, Yeah. beyond fair use, Yeah. but they would have access. Yeah, and, and I figured that. I, I have to talk to my sisters. They just weren't happy with um, them being in it, like there's nothing to do with my dad's stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they didn't want to be in it, so I did go through it and I did take some stuff out that but they didn't like. In the my dad's the, some autobiography, living sisters. <coughs> a lot of the history of them is in here of their lives. Like there's an incident where my nephew got run over by a car, and she says, "Well, I don't think he wants that in there. Nobody to know that." So I went and took it out. So they're just little things like that, and because they weren't never married, but yet they had boyfriends, they says, "Well, nobody needs to know that." Yeah, I do have a child from somebody, but that's nobody's business. So they don't like little things like that put in there because they weren't married and traveling around. <laughs> I, I will say that a lot of people that come in, especially for the family histories, mm -hmm. they're actually looking for genealogy. So, <laughs> long view. It's actually good, even if it's embarrassing now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, I know. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I had an aunt, a great, a great aunt, I wanted to interview her before she passed away. She did not want to be on camera, and I was like, <laughs> <laughs> so now she's gone, and I don't have anything. I don't have her life story. Yep, it yeah, happens. Like just recording her audio, but I was doing it for a kind of a little documentary <laughs> I was doing on my grandpa. Mm. All three so, of my sisters says, nope, I don't want to be on camera. You do it. You're a better talker. <laughs> and I says, well, I don't want to be on here either, but if well, I don't do it, who's going to do it? to your sisters that this would be <clears> only uh, sitting here and not, it won't be any, you know, nobody can use it to to make a book of their own mm -hmm. or anything like that. It would just be sitting here Honestly, as reference the, only. The most it would be. if they would allow it to be in here so that at least you know where one copy is safely, you know, for, for safety, another place of safety besides your archives, another place of safety. And um, also ask about the two genealogy books that you brought mm -hmm. that you said you might give permission for us to scan some of those pictures and things? I'm fine with that because that's the only copy we have. Mm -hmm. If that something happens to that, then we're I all out. I'd be willing to find volunteers <coughs> to do it myself as far as the scanning goes, if you would let me use your scanning Absolutely. equipment in the next, you know, month or so. Yeah, and I'm, I'm happy to help with your, I mean, if you're trying to get kind of buzz out about a new book that you're mm -hmm. coming out with. Uh, I mean, I'm, 
I'm on petroglyph Facebook groups. And yeah, I'm on one of them also. And they're always like, you know, what does this mean or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's so great to have a little video clip of you mm -hmm. with the petroglyph talking about it. I've been wanting to do that because I've seen a lot of things on YouTube lately because I'm learning sign language because it has to do with the writing. And so what I wanted to do more the for sign mm -hmm, the Indian sign language, I wanted to do more for the, the Indians, but of course the YouTube, anybody can access it, but I wanted to do a sign a day. Yeah, <coughs> yeah. something like that. that a sign a day. Right. And then in the corner have a picture of a petroglyph that yes. may have the symbol. Oh, and so I want to oh, do that. That's, that's, like perfect <laughs> that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. Great idea. So I'm trying to think of ways to generate money because I want to travel and I can't travel without funds. And I'm starting to get back into dancing, but dancing it takes me away from my family and my husband's not happy with it. <laughs> he wants me home where I've been the past eight years. And I says, you've, you've tamed, uh, my, my friend calls me a, a fire horse. You've tamed a fire horse for eight years, but that corral's getting pretty small. Pretty small. <laughs> Gotta get so um, I told he. <laughs> I mean, you could do just like a, a quick ebook of signs and symbols, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and get and get that out first mm -hmm. before the whole you know your whole dictionary is yeah. done. Yeah. Well, right. What I'm going to do right now because I do got my dad's website up. Um, I want to sell a poster size picture of the petroglyph that is up at Vernal and it's a famous petroglyph symbol of a whole bunch of men standing in a row three kings mm -hmm. I think it's oh, the yeah. three kings yeah. and my dad interpreted the whole thing he oh, has wow. writing so small on every little symbol so I want to do a poster size of the three kings and because I don't have the access to go take the actual photo. I don't want to use somebody else's because they're going to say, well, you right. owe me for the poster. You. Right. So I'm going to draw it. I'm going to draw a lifelike poster size and I'm going to have the symbol meanings below it to generate maybe $15 for the poster or something. So I want to do a little interpretation, um, uh, whether it's just sending it to somebody of the symbol, a famous symbol. <clears throat> that means something to just start generating a little bit of money and then maybe start the, the symbol a day mm -hmm. thing. Just just little things like that, just to, to get some funds and then um, small volumes of stuff. 